audiobook titled Gate Journey in the New World, 00-37, by Dom2040 Part 02. This work belongs to author Dom2040, sourcescribblehub.com. The hooded figure spoke in a very distorted and twisted voice, which made it tough for the men to distinguish the latter's gender. They couldn't comprehend if this was a highly skilled mage or a demonic specter itself, though in the back of their minds, they asked themselves if this has something to do with the local folklore itself. Who are you? One of the men demanded as he could feel his whole body trembling in fear. Simultaneously, all of them drew out their swords as they now find themselves in the face of danger. You killed our boss. You will pay for what you've done. One of them exclaimed a man, who was brave enough to challenge the specter and made his charge. The cloaked figure only stood there as it waited for the man to make his first strike. Though in the blink of an eye, the brave man was diagonally sliced in half, killing him instantly and adding more blood on the floor. It didn't take too long enough for the rest of them to charge at her at the same time, which turned out to be the worst decision of their entire lives. According to their own strategy, their strength in numbers could overpower just one person, and they were all confident about that. However, as the remaining brave ones charged at the figure, they would soon suffer the same fate as each of them got chopped into pieces in just mere seconds like meat on the market. Half-sliced bodies flew everywhere. One bandit got a portion of his head cut off, sending his skull-cap-covered brain towards a fellow bandit, hitting him directly on the face, adding more trauma to his mind. Another one got his head mashed into bits turning it into ground beef with blood filling it like sauce. And the rest of the men died in different variations. Two of them got impaled together like a barbecue on sticks and then smashed towards the ground. With that finally taken care of, the hooded specter slowly walked towards the men as it began to speak once again. Gentlemen, thank you for the charity of your lives tonight. I hereby express my gratitude in the place of my master. The hooded figure announced before giving slight devious laughter. W what the fuck are you talking about? One of the men asked, now hesitant to attack. The hooded figure continued as it raised its weapon towards them. God has laid eyes upon you and sent an invitation to join him in his world. May you all be so fortunate. Vaughn could sense the terror emanating from the specter. He knew it wasn't human and described the presence as sinister and evil. Was it a vengeful spirit who escaped from the underworld? Though as the rest of his fellow comrades were in deep doubt and fear, he took notice of the woman and her daughters, who were just recovering from the trauma they had endured. Instead of engaging in a fight with the figure, he ran towards the three villagers in order to help them much to his comrade's shock and disappointment. Vaughn, you coward! Get back here! XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Not a moment too soon, his hand was able to reach the hood itself, and then removed it revealing his enemy's true face which utterly shocked and amazed him. Those hypnotic crimson red eyes were imprinted on his mind forever as his life force dwindled. Amongst the long smooth black hair and the expression, overall, he had never seen the hauntingly beautiful face of death in his life. And but now he was at least thankful that he had a chance. You're beautiful. He muttered aloud as that was his last words, his lips then formed into a small smile. Soon after he lost his consciousness, as his soul finally departed from his body. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the rays of the moonlight shining over the cloak specter as Vaughn was given a brief chance of seeing through its identity. He saw a glimpse of its beautiful face and blood-red eyes with a faint smile that he could not comprehend. The smile looked more benevolent from what he had seen. His instincts kicked in as he gave a slight bow towards the apostle as a sign of his own respect. Never in his life would he meet the holiness in person, and from what he saw, there was this mystic hidden beneath that cloaked and hood. The once urban legend and myth he perceived to be since he was a child, had become now a reality. Then at that moment, he never felt thankful for what he has in his life. It did not spoke but instead slightly raised a hand pointing towards a certain direction. At the same time, Vaughn recognized a certain pathway which will lead him and the three villages to the nearby village ahead. He then realized that the being was telling him to lead these three to safety, and where they would recover. He then looked back towards the apostle and gave the being a slow nod. Satisfied with what it had seen, the same darkness from before returned to envelop the hooded specter, and it finally vanished from the scene in the blink of an eye. But not before warning the man through a certain poke in the chest, that if he did anything stupid or malicious, he would suffer the same fate as his comrades before. The whole area was engulfed in another silence. Sensing that the conflict was finally over, Vaughn wasted no time in assisting the mother and daughters and led them to the nearest civilization ahead. Prior to that, he took a quick glance at the location where his former comrades were now laid to rest, all of them meeting their own violent deaths as per what those visions had told him prior. How lucky he was to reconsider his decision and immediately break ties with them, but at the same time, he could hear most of them branding him a coward for not showing the courage to fight alongside them. That was his only guilt and regret. These men had helped him throughout the journey, taught him how to defend himself, and many more. However, he did not agree with their own intentions of violating innocent people. His thoughts finally ended as he turned around and led the mother and her young daughters away from this place towards their destination. Despite his knowledge of what happened after he left, the remains of his slain comrade began to slowly disintegrate into a blue-greenish ethereal-like substance that evaporated to the air like waves or threads. Not long after, peace and quietness had returned to the area, no one ever knowing what had transpired under the moonlight. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
but the final decision wasn't coming to fruition soon unless some miracle would intervene. The old man sighed as he grabbed his tea from the table and started drinking to relieve more of his tiredness. He sat there on his chair and took the time to enjoy the view. Though as he was in the middle of finally finding the relaxation he longed for and deserved when he suddenly felt a presence approaching. Cato slightly jolted from his seat as he narrowed his eyes towards the large bushes in search of that presence. At that very moment, his heartbeat started to go fast. He grabbed his staff which was just right beside him just in case it was malevolent. The presence that he felt was so heavy and overwhelming, though there was a slight hint of familiarity to it. Then in the next moment, he caught a glimpse of a black figure that went and passed by the area. But before that, it halted and took a quick glance at the old man, showing the familiar blood-red eyes that illuminated from the black void. It gave him a small eerie smile before continuing on towards its destination. Cato sighed after what he had just witnessed. His suspicions were correct as he then let his guard down permanently. The thought of a powerful beast suddenly attacking his home from nowhere came up to his mind. It definitely gave him shivers down his spine. Although, he was able to brush it off quickly. His old friend was even more powerful than any beast he fought against in his lifetime. He would even tell people how generations of demons feared it. The actions that it has taken made a huge impact for hundreds of years. It was so unfortunate that he had the chance to meet her. He returns back to his chair and took another deep breath. While trying to clear his thoughts, he asked a certain question to himself, wondering what new situation will he be dragged into tomorrow. What did she do this time? Chapter End And hello again. So I really wasn't expecting to create a chapter based on the intro of a planned major chapter in the future. Prior to writing this chapter, I've rewatched the scene in episode 3 involving Rory's first introduction and chapter 4 of the manga. And I thought it kinda happened so quick. So something came up in my mind and decided to eventually write a chapter dedicated to that certain scene. As for the perspectives in this chapter, it will still remain small and personal and through the eyes of another character named Vaughn. For the mysterious figure, Rory of course, in this chapter, I wanted to change it up a little bit and made her presence more ambiguous, mysterious, and calm. Her original introduction in the manga and anime series was kind of a bit grand or bombastic along with straight up telling her name and revealing her identity. I wanted to make the impression that not all New World natives believe in apostles or gods, hence why the bandits think it was just a myth or legend. As for old man sage Cato, I originally plan on introducing him for the next chapter, but a reader had suggested that I should make a connection or ties between him and of course her. According to the original novel, he was great friends with Mimosa and sometimes getting his but kicked due to his perverted antics. Something of a Jiraiya slash Tsunade type of friendship and during that time, Rory was still a teacher at Rondell, so it might be possible that he had met her once. Also, I apologize for any grammar and spelling mistakes since English is not my main mother tongue. With that said, thank you very much for reading the chapter and your support. I really appreciate it. 20. Arc 1, First Contact, Kota Village Part 1 Disclaimer I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Lands of Rodinius Chapter 7, First Contact, Kota Village Part 1 It was foretold that the peace which was brought thousands of years prior began in a fateful meeting between two worlds. Some say it was an act of desperation and fate that had brought upon a miracle a kind of miracle that has never returned once it had ended. And some say it was the cries of a forgotten one that summoned an unimaginable force that many had feared but loved at the same time. They came from a different world but had shown a very familiar value. The same value that would unite all of them. And when the conflict came to an end, they just left without any conditions or whatsoever. Never to be seen again. Their legend grew over thousands of years their contributions ushering in a new era for the whole world. Though, in an era where a rising evil is waiting to erupt, fate had made its move again and saw the meeting of these two worlds. Deep down in a certain forest, a beautiful young woman knelt amongst the grass, clutching her hands together, as she silently prayed continuously. The rays of the sun penetrating through the trees, the faint rustling that is produced as the wind slowly blew past by her. She didn't know how much time had passed. 
She was nothing but only a forgotten memory of the people she once blessed. Though, no matter what happened all those years ago, her love for them and this world continued to be strong. As she finally felt that the gods had finally made their move, a smile crept upon her lips as she opened her eyes for the first time and uttered her words. Please guide them. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Hey, that's quite a lot of sheep. Carl had voiced his opinion. I wonder if Mike had finally decided to raise his own back in his barn. His big brother slightly nodded in understanding. Lieutenant Brian shrugged thereafter. The thought of his cousin raising his sheep along with the other barnyard animals was quite far-fetched. The man's culture and way of raising things were very different. Brian really didn't want to talk about his first cousin. For all, he knew the man was just like his father but in a different form. Of course, Carl had realized by that point, bringing out a quite sensitive topic did kind of change the mood a bit. But at the same time, he couldn't help but wonder if there was a chance those two would end a bitter rivalry. He was about to speak up when the older Wilson had beat him to it. We're almost there. The words rang through his ears as the young Californian ranger brought his eyes forward to the main road again. Guys, we're heading off to the left. His brother picked up the wired walkie and informed the rest of the recon team. Copy that lieutenant. There was a small intersection ahead and a ladder road and onto a certain dirt track which led to a small forest. The rest of the recon vehicles followed as the team had finally reached the territory they'd been working hard to go to. After two days of endless travel, up from a distance, the team could see a meager-sized settlement located on the bank of a long, small river flowing with a rapid current. The village was walled by a short wooden palisade on three sides while the northern flank was guarded by the river. From a distance, they could spot what appeared to be that of villagers outside of the wall, hurrying inside through the main gate at the sight of his team's approach, taking their baskets of food and carts of goods within. It was no surprise that fear was their first reaction, with the exception of children, who were overwhelmed with curiosity, and even wanted to stay and meet the new travelers. Well, it's not every day you see giant metal boxes with wheels moving around. I mean, I was in their position. Reactions much like this are expected. We just have to adjust the situation we are in. I guess it's now our responsibility to show we are good guys then. That's if they are willing to listen. As the military vehicles approached the place, there was a large boarded sign above the village's gate written in this world's language. Code of Village. XXXXXXXXXXX. In the heart of the forest that surrounded the other part of the village lies a certain endpoint of the river. The place was considered a hidden gem for many of the villagers in hopes of finding their own peace. Moreover, the area's main highlight was revealed to be that of a majestic small waterfall. A waterfall that had existed there for hundreds of years even before the settlement was established. Although in recent times, the place had become some kind of a getaway or hangout for Kota villagers who saw the waterfall and its surrounding area as means to have fun, and a factor for their leisure. As for a certain short blue-haired 16-year-old teenage girl, she considered this place as her training ground since the first time she had moved here. Lele La Relina was a prodigy, but she didn't view herself as one either. That certain title was coined by her teacher, the one and only great sage Cato, who took her as his apprentice when the latter had chosen study under him and left Rondell overall. Originally, Hailing from a nomadic tribe called the Rurudo, the teenage girl was already fascinated with magic. As a child when she saw a couple of travelers, who were revealed to be archmages that just happened to stumbled upon their settlement, which they were eventually welcomed. As a token of appreciation, these archmages performed wonderful magical feats that captured and captivated the girl to the point that it had been engraved inside her mind until now. That's when her passion to study magic began to rise and together with her big sister. They left home due to a strained relationship with their stepfather and headed for the walled city of Rondell, one of the oldest and greatest places in terms of knowledge and magical advancements. The girl smiled as she could still remember the day she finally learned how to cast her own spell. It was a beginner's luck but important progress in her learning. Donning her usual blue robes, the teenage girl woke up one early morning and headed to this place with nothing but a small basket of bread, a book, and her staff. The sun was still on its rise when the girl stood on a certain spot facing the waterfalls, the rays of the sun shining upon her while she closed her eyes in order to get a grasp of peace which was overflowing at the moment. She liked quiet places much like this, where she would find her full concentration. She could feel and hear everything in her surroundings. The birds were singing along with the forest, the trees going along with the wind, and the tranquility of nature that welcomed her with open arms. 
In her mind, she imagined herself being this ethereal void as all of the kinds of energy on her surroundings began circling around her. All of it began to mix and melt together forming an ethereal-like stream that floated around her. Slowly but surely, she raised her right hand which wielded her staff. Her lips moved for the first time as she began to utter words that would eventually cast a spell in a certain direction. The wind grew stronger passing by her. Moments later all of the energy that had gathered and materialized converged in the body of water. As a result, the flowing current was disrupted and waves began to rise until a big portion of water had detached from its main source. With the help of the wind, the portion of water floated in the air as it began to form together creating a glowing ball of water that remained and continued to spun around. It grew larger and larger until the energy had reached its peak. Lele then opened her eyes to face the energy that she had created. A sense of pride and confidence overwhelmed her. All those months of honing her manipulation magic were beginning to blossom. She never did skip any steps to begin with. The young teenage girl continued as she manipulated the water ball of spinning energy around directing it to certain spots and back towards its current position. It was like dancing with the world's force, creating a connection between the physical world and nature. In the back of her mind, the whole process was very surreal for her. She couldn't believe she was doing this right now. Her smile continued to widen for the first time as her groove followed through. This was the meaning of hard work paying off. All that late night studies just to xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
another said much to the girls secretly laughing on the inside. And stop using cheap moves at me when I'm peacefully minding my own business, she replied back, trying to keep her joy of a little revenge from not bursting out while maintaining that calm facade at the same time. The rest of the group had mixed feelings about it. Some were irritated, and some were even thankful, that they had enjoyed the big waves of fresh water wriggling their worlds. Hey, Lole, can you do it again? One member of the group asked. Shut it, idiot. I almost drowned myself because of that. Satisfied from what she had done, Lele decided to leave the scene as peaceful as possible. Though before she could turn back, her friend called her once more. I told you so. It was Luke and he had that accomplished smile as he looked through the teen's eyes. All the boy wanted was to at least bring out that certain part of her. Every time they would pull a prank on her, the girl would never respond back and would just walk away from it. Here, she responded to that for the first time much to the blue-haired teen's realization later on. Lele slowly nodded but gave a small smile in return before leaving the area. It was the first time she had let out a kind of emotion that everybody was waiting. To the young mage, it did felt good when she responded back. It was a sense of overwhelming satisfaction to finally get back for all the pranks they had pulled in a good way to finally end that small chapter. Clever. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and as he was about to head towards his room again in order to get his staff and hat, he suddenly heard knocks on the door. The old man widened his eyes. Lalay? He wondered to himself, having faith that the blue-haired teen had finally arrived back home. He wasted no time heading towards the living room and into the entrance door where the source of the knocking originated from. I'm coming. He uttered as he reached and grabbed the knob. When he finally opened the door, his widened as the old man was overwhelmed with surprise. Rory? He mentioned that certain name, as he found himself staring at an old friend of his from the past. It was her smile that caught his eyes, the same smile when he first saw her from forty years ago. A beautiful adolescent girl in her mid to late teens stood in front of the sage. She had long flowing black hair with bangs on her forehead tied into a ponytail, hypnotic ruby colored eyes, and reddish lips. She wore a simple dress and carried a small basket of goods, just like any other commoner, and despite the young appearance, she exuded a certainly matured facade of a lady. She raised an eyebrow at the sight of the semi-weary and desperate old mage. You seem terrible, Cato. For the first time, she spoke, her young, confident, and mature voice coming out from her lips. For a brief moment, the old man stared at the girl. His memory began to juggle up as an image of a knightly cloaked specter under the moonlight flashed before his eyes. My apologies, Rory. I'm not in the right condition this morning, he explained. I ran out of tea and, planning to go buy tea some more after you ran out of that addictive beans, isn't it? The girl said with an amused expression completing the sentence just for him. Cato simply nodded. Took the words out of my mouth, I'm impressed. He commented. Rory giggled in response. Oh, Cato, you're still the same old handsome young man that I've met back at Rondell. She said as she scratched her chin. I wonder what you were doing at that small spot near the bathhouse. She gave a playful smile. There was hardly any reaction from the old sage, rather than giving a sigh and semi-serious expression. I know. But tell me something. He said, looking straight at her eyes. What happened last night, and what brings you here? He finally asked the question that had been also bothering him. In the back of his mind, he had hoped the latter hadn't do something that would change the fate of this reality. There was quietness for a few moments before the girl burst into small laughter. Don't be such a gauche, Cato. She replied, brushing the small worries off, showing her small basket, revealing a supply of tea and sweets. With that, the demigoddess smiled. Let's have a morning tea party. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He had escaped with his life still in one piece as his furious childhood friend had chased him all throughout the city with the intention of ripping him apart. Cato blushed in embarrassment, remembering that final day. It was just unfortunate that he didn't get the chance to say a proper farewell to his family and other friends, who only had been receiving letters from him until now. Mimosa, on the other hand, guess he'll just call it a complicated long-distance relationship for the time being. Here's the tea. The old man snapped from his thoughts as he found himself looking at the young lady, who was carrying the wooden tray containing two cups of hot tea. The sweet aroma of the drink spreading out all over the living room, making the ambience of the place a bit more relaxing. It was not long that the small tea party had started, and progressed in the form of simple conversations between the two friends. A big ceramic bowl containing biscuits was placed on the table and acted as their appetizers. Rory was enjoying the time indeed as she always liked the vibe she was getting whenever she was having tea and snacks. She didn't belong to any royal family or nobles, it was just a part of her hobbies nowadays. A part of her goal to live a normal as much as possible, even though sometimes her job would just keep calling whenever it needed her. As for the old mage himself, Cato had been wanting to ask the question, and mystery bothered him, though before he could open his mouth, the girl spoke first. So, have you finally read Mimosa's letter? Rory casually asked, sipping her own tea. Cato sighed. No, I haven't, he replied. My time has been limited if you know what I mean. He shrugged, instead of pointing at his workstation where various maps and scrolls were placed. Oh, Rory widened her eyes before smiling. Well, I guess I should let her know that you're quite the busy man nowadays. And at least, she would think that you're a changed man now. She added. There was a brief moment of silence that followed. No, I haven't read the letter yet. Cato slightly nodded. I'm still the same old man you knew, but you could say that I'm a much better person than before. He explained. Fine by me. Rory giggled taking a sip from her tea. She had a lot of questions in mind. Topics wanted to discuss, be it new theories, current events happening around the land, and as well as family. So how are things so far with Lele? Kato gave a small smile. Well, she's been waking up much earlier than me lately. I have to guess, it's her eagerness to learn more. He explained, showing a slightly guilty expression. I haven't had the time to teach her recently and I think that's why she's so estranged about it. Pity, the demigoddess muttered, showing her own version of sympathy. The old man's situation had recently become more complicated. His main job right now is cartographing maps of various areas of the continent, which he is updating and detailing based on his recent travels and research. Of course, there were travelers or merchants who would pass through the village and head straight for him to see if they could buy any maps that would be useful to them as they traveled across the lands. In truth, there was hardly any time for magic. It was more of needing to do something to put food on the table. Another fact was the youth of Kota village hardly have the interest to learn the basic ways of how to use magic or theories that would have to help them gain more knowledge in return. He did felt a little disappointed, citing the fact that most of the villages in the continent had no access to proper education, and Kota village was no exception. He then turned his eyes towards the beautiful black-haired girl. So how are things so far with you? He asked. Oh, just the usual. Errands here and there, seeing the wonders of the gods' creation. Rory smiled as she reflected on her recent travels. And just to remind you again that I've been doing Mimosa's favor by babysitting. Oops, keeping an eye on your current condition. She giggled and blushed slightly. Please accept my apologies for using the incorrect word. Kato sighed in response but continued to listen. And I also came across a group of bandits not too long ago. Hearing her statement, woken up the old man from his relaxed state. It was during nighttime inside some small field in the forest, and they were happily and desperately trying to violate a mother and her two daughters, she explained. And they were also planning to raid the village within a week. Cato widened his eyes surprised but didn't ask any more questions since he knew where this was going. I did what I had to do. Rory simply said a hint of seriousness coming out from her voice, before drinking her tea once more. Quietness befell the room for a few moments. The old man slowly nodded. How many of those bandits who you killed that night? He asked. The black-haired girl wondered. Hmm, there were a dozen of them. Half of them tried to strike me down 
and then half of them tried to run away. She explained as she recalled every detail of the event. Oh, and I spared one of them because he betrayed his own comrades in exchange for saving the mother and daughters. Rory's face was filled with amusement and a little delight. She had rarely seen an irredeemable person have a sudden change of heart. Or perhaps the young soldier had a good heart in the beginning after all. Do what makes things right. A common principle of herself and the home where she came from. Sure, many people look to her as someone who is to be feared due to her ruthlessness, cruelty, and bloodlust. But in truth, she was just any person trying to balance her situation between what's left of her humanity and being an apostle for her God. Being an apostle for 960 years wasn't that easy, to begin with. She almost lost everything because of that. Having the image as an angel of death or dark apostle didn't stick to her liking. In fact, she hated those monikers which were just made up in the form of urban legends across the land. All those years, she finally had found what she wanted to be when she ascends into godhood. Although for now, she was technically still a walking urban legend to the eyes of many soldiers and warriors. Kato nodded in understanding. I see, what of the young soldier, and the three villagers? Quietness befell Arya, Rory simply gave a smile. Well, you're gonna have to ask Eldar about that. The old sage stared at her in disbelief, finally, he knew what kind of situation he has gotten into. As he was about to say something, the door burst open, revealing the one and only Lily, almost all of her clothes wet except for her hair, which was now dried up and messy. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
That will have to be my fault again, he added bringing his head down. I promised to myself, I would spend more time teaching her, but then again, he trailed off. I think you should go back to teaching, at least just for your student, Rory suggested bringing out a smile, which also caught the old sage's attention. Plus, your office at Rondell is filled with dust and dirt since your last visit, she added. You're right, I'm too occupied on other things, Cato said, finally grabbing his tea and making his first drink out of it. By the gods, this tea is already cold. He complained for the first time as he stood up to get a hot refill at the kitchen. Rory gave a little laugh regarding that. The old man was too occupied with his thoughts and feelings that he had forgotten to drink his tea. Oh the power of conversations is just a magnificent thing. As he was about to head to the kitchen, the door suddenly burst open yet again. And this time it was one of the village's officials. Master Kato, urgent news, we have something going on at the gates. The village official said the man was tired from all that running, nervousness, and anxiety had taken him that he failed to notice what had transpired. Master Kato? Apparently, the old sage was startled by his appearance that he found himself slipping on a wet portion of the floor, courtesy of Lele, who had her clothes dripping in wetness prior. Oh, my back! Was the only thing that the old man had said, even though he landed safely. The village official was more confused than ever, and as he tried to comprehend what was going on, his attention was brought forward towards the black-haired girl, who gave him a smile. Honey, you do know how to knock on the door, right? Rory couldn't believe what had just happened. In just a matter of all these hocus-pocus, her tea time had now come to an abrupt end much to her disappointment. The demigoddess could only wonder what kind of emergency or commotion which had just arrived this time. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Hey, are you all right? It was the only thing that came out from the blue-haired girl as she happened to pass by the area when heading towards the small marketplace. Lele couldn't give in to her temptations. Mentally she was tired and wanted at least to get a brief rest before heading out to complete her goal. Though in a surprising coincidence, she happened to stumble upon a certain blonde-haired elf girl resting on a tree near the fields. She did manage to get the latter's attention, who only gave her a somewhat surprised look. I'm sorry for asking but, what is your name again? The young mage said, a bit embarrassed that she has forgotten the person's name, whom she had saved prior. Oh, it's Tuka. The elf girl simply replied, before focusing back on the view. As for the lele, she could sense that there was something bothering the elf girl, and much like hers. She eventually took a seat on one of the vacant spots under the tree. She did have to admit that from where she was now, the view of flightless bird farm and fields were breathtaking to an extent. It was a perfect spot for anyone who wanted peace at the moment. It was also not too long that a conversation would begin to form between the two girls. So, how's your stay in the village so far? The blue-haired mage asked, having the idea of getting to know her new friend more. Tuka flashed a small smile. It's fine, I'm very thankful for what you and your people did, she explained. If not for them, her father would have died from the injuries he had sustained. They're not my people. Lele slowly shook her head. I just moved to this place with my teacher, and I hardly even know the villagers here until... She trailed off as soon as she was about to finish her sentence. Never mind. Tuka nodded in understanding. She immediately understood what the girl had meant. I know. It must have been hard adjusting to a new place. She gave a little chuckle. From what she had experienced, seeing your village get destroyed, barely saving your loved one, and surviving an unexpected dragon attack only to find your way in a different place was the kind of adjustment she was going through right now, and it all happened in just one day. Was there really a need to adjust? She might as well accept what has happened to her. A small smile crept upon the young mage's lips. I can relate to that. She said as she brought her eyes towards the small sealed envelope containing her sister's letter. Rondell was the only place that she considered as a second home. Perhaps the main reason for this is that her only remaining family is currently residing there. Despite the sibling rivalry, Arpeggio was the sister she looked up to as a role model, and she aspired to be successful as a mage like her. Her sister will graduate in a month and begin her real training, according to the last letter she had read. Hopefully, the letter she was holding right now was the most recent good news. So is that man with the long beard, your grandfather or something? Tuka had finally come up with her own question. She wanted to clarify if the man that she had seen at the meeting was in any kind of relation to the blue-haired teen, since the two were wearing clothing in similar designs. For the first time, Lele smiled. No, Master Kato is my teacher, and I'm currently studying to be a mage under him. She explained, bringing up her gaze towards the blue sky. Well, I could say he is somewhat of a father figure to me. But as of recently, he's been doing other things than becoming the teacher he is supposed to be, Lele added, bringing forth a slight disappointment in her voice. She actually loved the old man as family and that will remain as it is, when she was struggling to find a teacher or an archmage to study under. The old man himself came forward and thus took her under his wing. She couldn't believe how happy she was that day, and as time passed, she didn't expect this would turn out differently. What about yours? She then asked. Quietness took over for a few moments before the elf girl was able to gather enough air to speak. Took aside. Well, my father is drunkard, a womanizer, and sometimes can't even fulfill his own duties, to begin with. She said, without any hesitation or embarrassment whatsoever. But still, he is able to pull himself together and be the better person he could be. She explained, still wondering to this day how her father managed to keep himself away from any possible trouble. There was still some proudness left intact in her, and damn sure because that, she wouldn't be the person she is now today. The responsibility had shifted to her. Lele, she called, grabbing the teen's attention. Do you think the village will throw us out? Tuka asked, a degree of uncertainty rising from within. Lele raised an eyebrow. No, why would you say that? She said, wondering why a welcoming village, much like Koda would throw them out. Tuka shook her head and took a deep breath after that. Um, it's nothing. 
I guess I'm just too overthinking right now. After that, she apologized. But on the other hand, thank you for helping me and father. She went on to say. The young mage just smiled as she showed assurance to the elf girl. Don't worry, you'll be safe here. The two girls continued their conversation, forming a new friendship. Unbeknownst to them, an unexpected event was taking place in the village's main square at the same time. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
in an attempt to convince them to buy their goods and products since they assumed they all came from nobility or were just plainly rich. Some of their suspicions were clarified when one of the soldiers spoke perfectly in their own mother tongue. Meanwhile, from the recon team's perspective, a lot of them were overwhelmed by the sheer amount of hospitality brought in by the villagers. In a surprising twist, they could understand what they were saying, or they forgot important information about which they had been previously informed. I thought there was a language barrier. Lieutenant Brian looked over to the Japanese recon captain, who also had the same surprise expression. There was no language barrier, to begin with at least in these places. The two men brought to their attention Yuji. What do you mean? Itami asked. Before Yuji could answer back, a voice had interrupted him. Please calm yourselves. By that point in time, the commotion had dwindled down as an elderly man stepped out from the crowd. He was short, and had gray hair under a brown-brimmed hat, matched by an equally gray mustache that stretched across his upper lips. He slightly bowed before the two leaders of the recon team and spoke. My name is Eldar Alterna. I am the chief of this village. It was the same voice who had called them from behind the crowd. At the same time, Rory and Kato arrived on the scene, and they were greeted with a sense of anticipation. To what may I address you, humble travelers? He asked politely. There was a silence that befell for a few moments amongst the recon team members, still recovering from the surrealness that they were receiving. Both sides were unaware that in a normal morning much like this, an important part of history had finally taken place. That's when Yuji stepped in again, recalling what the merchant duke had said to them not long ago. He took a deep breath and said the words that would live on in the minds of the villagers for the rest of their lives. We're the men in green, sir. Chapter End and that's a wrap for this chapter. I have to admit it was pretty tiring to come up with words and detailing the scenes and conversations. I wanted to make the scenes as if we were watching an actual movie or show. I'm not sure if I ever did achieve it. As for the story, fleshing out the character's background was also challenging. I had to look up references in order to get the exact idea I want for them. For Rory in this story, I planned on giving her more personality, in terms of her character. From the fics that I've read so far and most of them had portrayed her similar to the original one in the main series with similar introductions, except for several fics which were able to tweak her personality and character. My vision for Rory so far is to make her more in terms of not being that gothic little girl that would creep everyone out. Hence, why her appearance here is a little bit more older and mature. I'm also curious to see how her new personality unfolds in future chapters. Regarding Lele and Tuka, the idea for them was to basically explore more of their friendly relationship, the problems that they are currently facing, and the unexpected roles they'll be placed in the future. For old man Sage Kato, reading up his actual background, was kind of funny and interesting at the same. He kind of reminds me of Jiraiya to be honest. Just like in the other chapters, the scenes here are small and personal. Also, I apologize for any grammar and spelling mistakes since English is not my main mother tongue. With that said, thank you very much for reading the chapter and your support. I really appreciate it. 19. Arc 1, Kota Village Part 2 Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Lands of Rodinius Chapter 8, First Contact Kota Village Part 2 it was the humid and cramped up atmosphere that kept their awareness to a much high level the second they entered the small hall, where the meeting was to be held. The long wooden table that stretched both sides all the way to the ends of the hall had greeted them. The wooden interiors and other simple but unique designs wowed the recon team members, who couldn't help but look around. It was like stepping into a museum, or more appropriately, back in time for a small two-story wooden town hall that resembled the ancestral buildings that belonged to one of Spain's colonies in the Orient. The scent of the place had a nostalgic vibe to it, but the furniture, vases, and other materials felt new or hadn't been abandoned by time. It was a surreal moment as they explored the current area that they were in. Seeing the small meeting hall had amped up their minds as a reminder that they were here to explain themselves and their situation. Yuji felt compelled to pull out his small camera along the way but instead chose to bring up his small notepad and pen for documentation. The Japanese-American man had found himself at one of the table's far ends, 
and he quickly placed his small bag just below and beside his seat. Along with him were the recon team's two main leaders, Itami, Lieutenant Brian, and finally Daisuke, who volunteered in case they needed to decipher and translate vital information in the form of written documents. Across from the table sat the local village chief Eldar, a wise man in his early sixties with a long white beard known as Sage Kato, and a certain village official with a suspicious and serious expression. The leaders of the recon team were informed that the other two individuals had the major roles in terms of dealing with the day-to-day -day life of the village. Furthermore, there was a pretty black-haired young lady in a simple village dress sitting on a wooden stool beside the entrance door. She had been observing the newcomers with a curious smile on her lips. Moment by moment her interest was growing. She stood up when the village chief made eye contact and the girl gave a simple smile in return. The rest of the recon team quickly took notice of the girl, and most of them were captivated by her mystery. She returned with a wooden tray containing cups of hot tea in the blink of an eye. The sweet scent and aroma of the tea had brought a sense of calm to the entire meeting hall. Moreover, the presence of this young lady was just very different in a way that they couldn't comprehend. From a physical standpoint, she looked around between her mid to late teens but had retained that childlike persona. Tea, gentlemen? The young lady finally spoke, bringing forth her beautiful ruby eyes towards the guests. Her young voice having this mature and elegant sound that would calm any person from their worries. It took a few seconds for them to return to their senses. Oh, thank you very much, Ms. Itami trailed off, realizing that he had no knowledge of her name yet. Rory, the young lady replied with a small smile. That is my name, she added, as she placed down the cup of tea in front of the Japanese lieutenant who secretly had a little blush on both of his cheeks, though managed to control himself. Yuji kept his gaze on the girl, carefully observing her, in a puzzled manner as he could sense some familiarity in her overall facade, as she proceeded to serve the other teas to the rest of the everyone seating around the long table. It wasn't too long after that he finally had the opportunity to meet her up close and personal, when he turned out to be the last person to be served by the tea. As the young lady greeted him, he first noticed her smile. Not long after, his gaze was drawn upward to catch a glimpse of her ruby eyes, which briefly dazzled him. If he had to describe her eyes and the way she looked at people, he would use the words hypnotic and eerie. And when he finally tried to interact with her, he felt a sense of calm wash over him. Oh, thank you, Yuji then said, thanking the young lady in return. Enjoy, she simply said. Not long after, he decided to take a little sip of the tea and it completely confirmed his doubts. Wow, this is something else. He commented through his thoughts as he began to wonder what kind of tea was being served. Based on the reactions of the others, there was a hint of surprise and amazement on their faces, but quickly ended once the meeting had finally commenced. His attention shifted back towards the girl, only to find her having returned back to her seat in a matter of seconds. He blinked for a couple of times wondering how she got there so fast, yet the voice of the village chief had eventually broken his line of thoughts. So, Sir Tommy, what is it that you came here for? Eldar calmly asked, getting straight to the point, even though there was this small tension that remained in the air. For the first time, the Japanese lieutenant was placed on the front lines of testimonies. Prior to this Itami had discussed with his American counterpart regarding the truth in their own situation. He kept his face intact as it was decided that keeping the integrity was the best way to do it. There was a brief moment when he considered asking Daisuke to help him with the translation parts. But he reminded himself that whatever words came out of his mouth, everyone would understand them. Once again, there is no language barrier in this world. In his thoughts, he stated, everybody was waiting for the man's response. Eldar could only hope that these men in green were not who they appeared to be. They certainly do not belong to the Empire or any of its divisions or legions. The way they dressed was vastly different from what he had seen. Kato, too, had been deafeningly quiet for the past hour, clearly demonstrating that he had no idea who or what these men were. That solemn expression on his face at least answers some of the lingering questions. Rory, who had taken a back seat, maintained her interest in these men. It was the first time her curiosity had been piqued since hearing about rumors of a fallen army that vanished overnight in the Alnus fields. 
To add to the mystery, she had heard stories from travelers about these men in green riding in metallic chariots and metal forts that roared like the great mythical lions. Most believed they were to blame for the defeat of the massive army that had attacked the hill. In the minds of the locals, this is a reason to be afraid of them. We've come in peace, Mr. Eldar. The words finally came out of the man's mouth. Itami had mustered the courage to respond. Deep down, he knew it was a cliché of a phrase because he could see the others looking semi-surprised and puzzled at him. However, he believed that the words were simple enough for the locals to understand. They had more formality than he had thought. To be honest, we are not a part of the Empire's army or groups. The Japanese lieutenant explained, a small smile of assurance on his face. Our goal here is to show the locals that we are not here to harm or raid them. Fortunately, that erased the village chief's doubts and suspicions, and he was able to calm himself down with a sigh. Thank heavens, he muttered before taking a sip from his tea. Kato, for his part, remained silent but nodded in agreement. He cast a quick glance at the young lady, who gave him a simple nod. So far, even demigoddess could tell that this man was telling the truth. Right now, the question was, who exactly are they? The same question was rephrased by Eldar as he continued to wonder. Yuji noticed the tension returning and filling the entire hall. This was the moment when the much-awaited truth about their true identities would be revealed. So far, their only option has been to ensure that the rest of the would believe their story, even if it may seem far-fetched to them at first. If anything was possible in this world then it won't be surprised for them eventually. Itami swallowed and cleared his throat. Well, Mr. Eldar, you may or may not believe what I'm about to tell you, but hopefully you'll understand. He began by reminding the older man. Eldar gave a simple nod, indicating that he was willing to listen to and hear their side of the story. With that said, Itami took a deep breath as he finally dropped the most basic and direct statement he could think of. Me and the rest of us here are from another world. The Japanese lieutenant explained, and then silence followed. The older man's and the other's reactions were a mix of curiosity, disbelief, and puzzlement. Kato raised an eyebrow, a little skeptical about the man's claim. Eldar quickly regained his senses and said, Be pardon me Sir Tommy, but what do you mean that you're from another world? He asked. Basically, we are literally not from this world or any of the places here. The black-haired man was quick to reply. We are from a world called Earth, where magic is non-existent. Itami explained, he could feel his cold sweat dropping already, he didn't want to repeat the same phrase over and over again, his own nervousness materializing inside him. Kato's eyes widened when he heard the man's statement. So, they are from another world where magic doesn't exist? He asked himself, how could their claims be true if the only way to open a passageway to other worlds is by? It was at this moment that Lieutenant Brian had entered the conversation. It's an unbelievable story, Mr. Village Chief, but several months ago, a massive gate or doorway appeared in one of our world's countries. The explanation came from the American lieutenant. To cut a long story short, an army of these imperial soldiers, accompanied by their dragons and monsters, appeared and began killing and abducting our own people. Because of his statement, some of the memories from the Ginza incident, mostly from Itami and Yuji, resurfaced. The silence persisted in the room, allowing for more time for countless explanations. It was like putting together the right puzzle pieces to form a linear and cohesive story that would somehow make sense. Lieutenant Brian tried to recall what had happened from his own point of view. He happened to be a part of the counterattack that pushed the remaining Imperial Army back to the other side of the gate, as well as the subsequent power struggles. So our world's forces fought back, and by the time we got to the far end of the gate, it turned out to be some kind of big hill in the middle of the fields. Alnus Hill, Cato said for the first time, drawing everyone's attention. It's the largest hill in this region and the only hill surrounded by countryside. He elaborated. Lieutenant Brian gave a nod. Sir, yes. Confirming the older man's assertion. The location is currently our base of operations in this world. And we are currently attempting to locate our people who have been kidnapped by these imperial soldiers. He went on to say. Eldar's eyes widened in recognition at this point. His memory jogged and he remembered a story from a recent friend who had visited the village not long ago. Alnus Hill? 
that means the rumors about the Empire's expeditionary forces' defeat are true. As he tried to put the pieces together, the old man could feel a sense of fear creeping up on him. It wasn't the first story he'd heard. Countless travelers from previous weeks had relayed the same news, albeit from a different perspective. The majority of them claimed to have seen mysterious moving lights surrounding the hill at night, and the so-called disappearance of many imperial scouts or small expeditionary forces had been tied to it. Furthermore, their sudden appearance had fueled the conspiracy that these men were looking for people to recruit in their quest for vengeance. The old man was shaken. Sir Itami, I apologize, but before you say anything, I would like to say that Kota Village has always been small in size and its people have always lived peacefully, away from any ongoing or any wars. Even in these times of trouble, we have not aided the Empire or any of its allies. None of our young men had the capabilities to fight like them. At this point, Eldar had released his pleas. Being Imperial soldiers or not, it was often a very complicated issue when trusting strangers. Kato showed some concern towards the village chief. He took another gaze at Rory, who was surprisingly still sitting and listening to the whole conversation. Normally, she would have done something or at least give her own views about it. As for the men in green, their goal to reassure them was still not over yet. In the midst of that, Itami smiled even more, aware that the old man was even more nervous than he was. The chief was afraid of what the JSDF and American crew would do to his beloved village. Mr. Eldar, we assure you that we are not of any threat. He informed him yet again. We are actually exploring soldiers if that is familiar to you. He added. The tension slowly faded once more. Tell me, sir, what is your goal right now in this village? Silence followed after for a brief moment. We actually want to offer our assistance to whatever your village is going through right now. Lieutenant Brian spoke this time. Unless if we may know the village current situation. Eldar remained silent as he found himself in a slightly difficult situation. Should he tell them what was really happening? The fact that village's days were numbered. The old man sighed as he looked at the men in green straight to the eye. I'm afraid. The current situation would be overwhelming for the rest of you. Itami kept a straight a face. What do you mean, sir? He asked, and the old man glanced down in sorrow. We don't know if this village would last for the next days ahead. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
which eerily resembled colonial architecture with an Asian tropical flavor due to their triangular roofs. Furthermore, these houses were all in good condition, and the entire area he had passed through would already be listed on UNESCO's World Heritage List if the organization learned of this village. Besides the windy and humid scenery, it felt like being on a vacation. The sense of peace immediately captured him and led him to a smile of admiration and appreciation. Adding to the nearly complete experience, he caught sight of some children playing just outside their homes, enjoying the time of their lives. Seeing them triggered him to remember bits of his childhood memories when times were much simpler. He wondered why a village like this deserved to suffer the same fate as the other villages. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and it will be hard to assume that there will be a safe passage towards those places that you've mentioned, he added, and to also inform you that the villages outside of this area, well, most of them are burned to the ground. The man said it without any hesitation. He was reminded of the previously destroyed and ransacked villages that the recon team had passed through. Wait, you mean the neighboring villages to the south are gone? Cato inquired again, his puzzled gaze shifting briefly to Rory, who had displayed no emotions other than a semi-serious expression. Silence befell the meeting hall once more. I'm afraid it's true, sir. The only thing that the Japanese lieutenant could say, though they needed at least evidence to his statement. It was when uncertainty decided to enter the village chief's mind. It was only then that he realized how few travelers and merchants had visited the village in the previous weeks. Um, if you can excuse me, Mr. Eldar, but my friend here can show you some proof of these villages, Itami added, beckoning Yuji to take the responsibility this time. The writer took a deep breath as he unzipped his bag and drew out a small laptop and immediately turned it on much to the fascination and curiosity of the rest. Hmm, that's an interesting device you've got there, young man. Kato slipped a remark out. It was the first time he'd seen such machinery capable of producing some kind of light magic. May I know what is the name of that silver box? The older man asked. These men in green were definitely different. The writer could only force an awkward smile. Well, hmm, it's called a laptop, sir, he replied. Basically, it can store information, images, and videos. Kato raised an eyebrow. Videos? It's basically a term for the moment you capture with this device, Yuji added, pulling out his small camera from the table. And then, once you've finally recorded that moment, you save that information back to the laptop. He explained as much as he could. Fascinating, Kato said as he began to examine the small device on his hands like it was some type of historic discovery. Its functions do resemble the wooden device from the northern civilizations. Indeed, for the first time, Rory made a remark, which drew the old man's attention. The young lady, like everyone else, had approached the table out of curiosity. So what moment did you capture using this device? The old man asked. At the same time, Yuji finally found the video's files of the countless villages the team has encountered before. With a single click the video began to play presenting the proof they have. That's the Alnus Highway. Eldar's eyes widened as he recognized a familiar stretch of wide dirt road on the screen of this strange device. He didn't have much time to consider whether this was powered by magic or mana, as the moving scenery had finally shifted towards the neighboring villages. As expected from the video and these men in green's claims, all of the villages had suffered the same fate. I it can be, the shocked and horrified old man stuttered for the first time as the video began to show more of the state of the neighboring villages that he had seen and visited a lot of times. Kato, on the other hand, had the same reaction but retreated into a more analytical state. He didn't want to believe their so-called evidence right away and wanted to investigate further, but a part of him was convinced that these men weren't fabricating their evidence and were telling the truth. He turned his gaze to Rory, who was looking at him with sorrow in her eyes. He wondered if she was also aware of the situation. Not long after, the video presentation had ended and silence returned once more to the meeting hall. The only hope of having a safe journey towards the principality had now been sent down the drain. For the first time, the question was brought up in Eldar's mind. They have nowhere to go. Now that the recon team had finally got to show their evidence thanks to Yuji's documentation. They were now hopeful that they would consider listening to their own proposal as well, at least for a certain Californian. Mr. Village Chief, Lieutenant Brian called out to their attention. If you're willing to listen, maybe there is still hope for your village, and we might have the place just for you and the villagers to settle down without having to worry about any dangers or problems. He explained, flashing a small smile for the first time. Everybody was a bit surprised by his statement especially Itami and the rest of the recon team. Yuji noticed the sudden shift in the atmosphere. The American ranger has an epiphany that could change the course of its mission. Eldar simply nodded. Very well, sir. To what kind of place is that you're referring to? Our base at Alnus Hill. The response was quick, enough to shock his Japanese counterpart, but did give the old man hope. In these dark times, who would really extend their help to a small and unknown village? 
Kato was surprised with the man generously offering assistance even though they had just met him and his group. But when he saw the disbelief of the latter's comrades, and the genuine look of his eyes, it eventually did manage to convince him that he was telling no lies. Eldar was a bit lost for words at first. Sir, if I may ask, would we be accepted in your place? He asked. Are we really going to be safe there? Silence briefly followed again, as the American ranger kept his smile. Don't worry, sir. We guarantee that you and the rest of the village will no longer be suffering under Empire's wrongdoings. He added, You all be living your lives uninterrupted there. Even if you refuse, we understand your decision, he stated. But please, allow us to assist your village in any way we can. All he required from them was trust. He didn't want to sound like a savior or anything. But he had to give it his all. He knew things were changing the moment he said that. In the midst of that bold move, a new voice had entered and broken the silence. We appreciate your offer, but I'm afraid you and your group are only endangering our people. Everyone's attention was drawn to the other village official, who had remained silent throughout the meeting. He was a man in his late to early twenties, had dark brown hair, and a semi-fierce and hostile facade. I beg your pardon, sir? Lieutenant Bryan said, a bit taken aback because of his statement. We don't need your help. We don't even know what your true intentions are, and we can all guess that your plan will only put many of us here in danger. The man stated his point once more. Without due respect, sir, but we have no intention to lead the village into it. Tommy spoke this time, but was then suddenly cut by the man. It makes no difference. My top priority here is the safety of this village, and we don't trust outsiders like you, he went on to say. So we refuse to accept your help. His presence increased the tension in the room. For the first time, the two recon team leaders felt even more irritated than before. Kato, too, was turned off by the man's sudden outburst and attitude. Since when did you become the village chief, Marcus? Rory interfered, letting out her own sarcasm. Oh, if it isn't the little Miss Beauty herself. The man smirked. You don't know anything, and you don't have to interfere with something that isn't your concern. He told the young lady. She simply smiled. Says the person who did nothing but brags about his irrelevant accomplishments. She replied, while also being an inept official. The way she spoke surprised the three men. The village official's expression shifted from amusement to annoyance. How dare you say that? He exclaimed. This village would not have survived the rest of the year if it hadn't been for me. Marcus, enough. Cato spoke this time. Attempting to prevent the situation from escalating, however, the man just ignored his warnings and glared at him. The village official known as Marcus stood up from his seat as he brought his eyes towards Eldar. Sir, I hope you would reconsider this decision, he told the older man before walking out of the meeting hall and headed straight for the door. As he left, Rory continued to stare at him in disgust, rolling her eyes before focusing back on the main situation. The recon team was stunned because they couldn't believe what had just happened. Add to that the fact that they were able to understand what they were saying. Eldar could only sigh. I apologized for what had just happened. Marcus is just protective of the village. He explained as he didn't bother to even drink his tea. We understand, sir. It's just that it was so sudden and he started throwing accusations at us out of nowhere, Itami said, wiping the sweat from his forehead. Typical for a hooligan of a man that he is, Rory smirked, adding more mystery for the recon team. Eldar cleared his throat as he looked towards the men in green. Well, we are very grateful to have you men in our village, and we thank you for the help that you could provide. He let out a small smile. But please bear with us a little while. It's not going to be easy for the villagers to pack their things up in mere minutes. As the meeting came to an end, the tension began to dissipate. The decision had been made, and the village will follow the men in green's lead en route to their so-called encampment near the hill. Yuji could feel the mental exhaustion sets in, but he was relieved that the meeting had ended on a positive note. The only issue on his end is that he did not record the entire conversation on his phone or recorder, as he was occupied with presenting all the necessary evidence that he had in the vault. Oh, by the way... You mentioned that you needed more information about this land and region? Eldar inquired while the rest nodded. Yes, sir. Then I guess Master Kato here would have that responsibility on providing what you need. The old man added before he finally stood up from his seat. 
Thank you for your time here. I appreciate what help you can bring in my home. The old man smiled, as he finally walked out of the room but not before eyeing the old bearded man and the young lady. I'll leave the rest to you, he said to them before finally leaving the area, with the attention of the men shifting towards them. Kato gave the young lady a look and vice versa. Then after a few moments, Rory flashed a smile towards the three men. Shall we proceed to the next phase, gentlemen? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I told them it was just regular medicine. She let out a long sigh. However, once again, some of them do not believe what I told them. An amused expression crept upon the JSDF soldier's face. Really, huh? So how's everything going so far outside? Mari asked this time. You don't want to know. The young lady sighed, knowing that there are still many tasks to do. Mari figured it out quickly enough. The villagers' raucous cries were obvious indicators. Oh, I see. They're still trying to persuade you to buy their stuff, huh? You said it best, sister, Shino replied, taking the opportunity to sit down for a few moments. They keep telling me about these denarii coins and prices that I have no idea about. She added, a little regretfully, that she didn't pay much attention in history class or whatever fantasy world anime or movie that her little brother would let her watch. I think it's their currency in this world, Mari guessed. Maybe or maybe not, it's just that things right now are driving me crazy. Shino exclaimed for a little bit. I thought we were supposed to be following our main objectives in this mission. She expressed her annoyance. The last time I checked we were a reconnaissance team, not a humanitarian group. Mari just shrugged. Well, this is all part of the experience, I guess, she said. But if you asked me, this is the best way that we can get to know these people personally. She added a smile. I mean look at the rest of the guys, they are having the time of their lives. Shino could be shrugged in return. She wasn't sure either of the two opinions. In fact, she was confused about what role she was going to assume here. In the midst of that moment, a familiar soldier entered the tent. Hey guys, is everything alright here? The Californian accent was a dead giveaway, as the individual turned out to be Lieutenant Carl Wilson, one of the rangers from the American crew. The man greeted the two women, who were taken aback by his unexpected arrival. Yes, everything is going good so far, Lieutenant. Mari smiled. The Californian smiled back. That's great to hear. Just here to check up on things, he explained. And you can just call me Carl, by the way, he added. All right, Carl-san. Thank you so much. It was the humbleness that impressed both women. Pleasure. Do you guys need any help as of now? The Californian asked as silence took over for the first time. Mari smiled before giving her friend a glance, to which the latter just rolled her eyes in return. The American ranger gave a semi-confused look, and as he was about to speak, the young Japanese lady beat him to it. Um, my friend here needs a little help to load out some supplies, she said, before encouraging the short-haired young woman to finally go and finish the remainder of her task. Carl blinked a couple of times before fixing his attention to the main person. Oh, your name is Shino, am I right? he asked, slightly gesturing to the air. Although the young woman just forced a smile, before her face reverted back into a much more snarky deadpan look, as she finally stood up and exited the tent. A little awkward silence followed as Carl gave Mari an even more confused look. Is she alright? he asked. Mari simply smiled in return. Nah, she just needs someone to talk to. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
and you're probably not going to understand the entire story that easily. He responded before gathering his own strength to push himself into the vehicle. Yuji was left with a more puzzled and confused expression. He wondered what the old sage had meant when he said complicated. Surely, Rory was just a teenage girl, who had that type of optimistic personality. The girl looked pretty much normal overall, though the way he reacted to it was far different. The young rider sighed as shook his head afterward. When he was about to head off towards the vehicle, he suddenly felt this extreme wave of heat that engulfed him. Moments later he could smell the scent of fire and burning wood everywhere. In just a blink of an eye, his world had suddenly changed. The once blue sky had turned a deep red, and the peaceful village around him had been consumed by a massive fire. The villagers' agonizing screams began to echo in his ears, and for the first time, he felt fear take control of him. Fortunately, it was all over soon as a familiar voice called out to his name. Yuji, are you alright man? He blinked a couple of times as he soon found himself staring at Semiko concerned Itami. You seem to be in a shock or something, the lieutenant added. The rider took a deep breath and gave little thumbs up at his friend. Yeah man, I'm fine, just one of those occasional headaches, he explained. Ah, I see, you got me worried there for a second, Itami said. We better go, we can't let them wait for long, the man said as he encouraged his friend to proceed to the vehicle. Yuji simply nodded and smiled. Yeah, I'll catch up, he replied as the young man tried to regain back his composure. The vision was still fresh in his mind. By the time he took another observation around his surroundings, everything was back as it was. He couldn't comprehend what he had just seen, and he could feel all the hair on his skin stood up at the same time. What was that all about? XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Hee hee sorry. Lele rolled her eyes in return. Why the heck are you playing folk ball in a crowded place like this? She asked. Hey. We were originally playing at the small field when two from the men in green joined us. Luke then smiled. And I tell ya, they play good folk ball. Men in green? Tuka asked as this was the first time she had heard such a moniker. The boy grinned. Yeah, and they speak our language, he added. In the midst of that, two of the men in green finally made their presence known, and as they were able to catch up with the rest. Man, can't believe these kids run faster than us, Higashi, one of the men said while trying to catch up to his breath. Exactly Takeo, the other agreed. The rest of the teenagers had their sweat drops due to the awkwardness that these men had brought. Anyways, these are the men in green that I'm telling you about. Luke continued to where he left off as he introduced the two to the girls. Karada and Higashi, am I right? He added. By this time, the two men had finally recovered and slightly raised their hands to wave at them. But as for Karada, the young soldier's otaku instincts immediately took over when he laid his eyes upon the blonde who had long pointy ears. Oh my god! I'm sure I'm dreaming. Is that an elf girl? He asked excitedly because he couldn't believe what he was seeing in front of him, and his hand then went to his pocket to reach for a specific device. He wasn't going to let this slip up right away. The rest had been taken aback by his sudden burst of reaction. Higashi, who had only recently realized that his fellow recon member had succumbed to his otaku tendencies, did not intervene immediately to stop him. Karada, please not now, he warned and exclaimed. On the other hand, there was visible confusion on both Lele and Tuka's faces as they observed this man in green approaching them in a subtle aggressive manner. This also led to misinterpretation, particularly for the elf girl, who mistook the man's actions for malicious and strange intent. As a result, when the man reached into his pocket and reached for Tuka, her instincts kicked in and she grabbed the man's hand and flipped him over to the ground in seconds. Lele's eyes widened with surprise as she watched her friend perform a hand-to-hand -hand combat maneuver on a much larger man than her. The other boys and girls were in awe of what the latter had just done. Although for Tuka herself, she quickly realized what she has done, and immediately attempted to redeem herself by helping the man out. Oh, I'm really sorry sir. I didn't know what had gotten into me. She apologized non-stop. I thought you were going to draw out your weapon and... I it's alright miss, he gets that a lot. Higashi rushed in and interfered as he let out an embarrassed grin. I'm sorry if he scared you, he just actually wants to take a selfie with you, he explained. Tuka slowly nodded but blinked in confusion. I understand sir, but what is a selfie? She asked as her gaze turns towards the man she just nearly injured. As he lay on the grass, the excited grin on Karada's face remained. He raised his right hand, which now held his smartphone, which was also in camera mode. This. Oh, you mean that small box he is holding? Lele asked this time. Higashi could only give out a sigh. It's complicated. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
organized in a way that perplexed the rest of the recon team. The rest of the area appeared to be more of an impromptu library than a living space for a person, though there was a kitchen area and two rooms to officially make this place a legitimate home. I apologized for the small mess. I didn't have enough time to clean up some things. Cato informed as he let the others inside. It's very cozy here, sir, Lieutenant Brian said, observing the interior of the cabin which turned out to be not bad at all. Rory giggled. That's why I often visit this place for a cup of tea. She added her own comment much to her friend shaking her head. It never ceases to amaze me. Yuji paused for a few moments to take in more of the surroundings inside the cabin, and his gaze was drawn to a large illustration on one of the walls. He was captivated by the painting the moment his eyes were drawn to it. The illustration depicted that of what seemed to be a very important event, or at least a story to be told for generations, the four races of humans, elves, dwarves, and beast men facing what appeared to be a force of great evil, while the powerful rays of the sun had spread out all over the world. He could feel all the hair on his skin standing as a chill went down his spine. By just staring at it for a minute, he felt that he had gone through this thousand-year odyssey that was just too great for any human being. It didn't take long enough for him to break his own concentration. Shaking his head and as well as rubbing his eyes regain himself back again. The three men were led into the small living room, and fortunately, there were enough spare wooden chairs for everyone and each took their own seats. When the young lady offered them another round of tea, they all politely declined. Suit yourselves, but please wait for Master Cato, he will be back soon, she informed the men. He needs to retrieve a lot of his things from his workstation. Understood ma'am. Lieutenant Brian nodded, as he decided to relax for the time being. By the way Rory, what does Mr. Cato do for a living? Itami was the one to ask this time. The girl raised both eyebrows. Oh, you mean to sustain his livelihood? She asked, while slightly scratching her chin. Well, he is a teacher at his hometown in Rondell. Although, he has self-exiled himself in this village due to some complex reasons. She explained with a smile. Self-exile? Oh, I assure you he did not commit a crime or whatsoever. Rory, clarified, before slightly cringing in some kind of playful heartfelt pain. Oh, love is such a complicated topic to tackle, she said, giving a quick wink at the men, to which they understand. Oh, I see. A slightly amused Yuji muttered. At least, he's got a lot of people there for him. Itami gave a little chuckle. I mean there's always love in all of us, whether you admit that you hated this person. He added, it's just a matter of prayer if the goddess of love answers it or something else. Rory smiled as she closed her eyes for a moment, revisiting her main dream from the beginning. True, always wanted to become the goddess of love, when the time comes for me to ascend. Her statement unknowingly caused confusion amongst the trio, and as Yuji was about to ask a question regarding her statement, he was beaten to it as the old sage finally came back carrying what appeared to be three big scrolls on his hands and the other which appeared to be floating midair. Itami nearly dropped his jaw in surprise. Everything he had been taught about the laws of physics had just been thrown out of the window before his very eyes. He glanced at his American counterpart, who also had a similar reaction, and Yuji, who somewhat was more astonished. Kato gave the scrolls in his hands a brief inspection before picking one with a red seal. This, Sir Itami, he said as with another snap of the finger he made the other scrolls flew to the table in a neat and smooth way. Is what you're most likely looking for. The most detailed map of the Alnus region. He broke the seal with a seal breaker and then unrolled the map across the surface of the table, placing paperweights on the edges. It's quite small than I expected, Brian commented, taking note of a small highlight of the region barely spreading out of the parchment. Yes sir, this region is one of the lands left unconquered by the Empire, though nowadays, there's a possibility of it being taken over, he explained. Hiding his amazement, Yuji took a good look at the map. Besides the region itself, the outline of a vast continent was displayed, stretched from one end to the other. Ranges of mountains and forests were sketched in, and certain regions of land were colored in different shades, perhaps indicating the biomes. There were small square blocks with words written above them in tight handwriting and assumed that these represented the cities of the continent. The overall illustration reminded him of a famous fantasy movie back in his world. Where are we? 
We, the mage pointed somewhere in the middle of the continent, are here. Itami nodded, and he recognized the strange wording that indicated Alnus. His eyes scanned the rest of the map. I'm guessing that these markings are the borders of the empire and the other two kingdoms. He pointed to the dark lines fencing the three lands. Cato simply nodded. Yes, sir, these two kingdoms are the Quatoin Principality and Kingdom of Quila. He informed them. Both of them are allied nations, while the other neighboring kingdoms have been conquered by the empire in recent years. Man, this is a lot to take in, Brian muttered, a bit overwhelmed by seeing every name of the places. Yes, it can be overwhelming, Cato agreed. But believe it or not, this whole map of the continent is one of the simplest and easiest maps to study, he explained. Wait, so you're saying there are more nations outside this continent? Brian asked, a bit surprised to hear that information. The old sage nodded. Yes, though I have to tell you that I don't possess enough knowledge of the outside world or the nations across the Great Oriental Sea, he said. Though during my younger years, I met a humble traveler hailing from the northern civilizations that visited my hometown. And from what I can recall, he owned a type of device that is similar to your cameras, he added. Pardon me, Sir Cato, but what does this device look like? It was Yuji's turn to ask. My memory is vague on that one but it was made of black light marble, or nylon, and had a big round mirror in the middle, he said. Is he referring to a vest pocket camera? Yuji thought to himself. The new information was indeed a revelation at least for the three of them. There were other lands and continents, and possible countries besides the one that they are in currently. The question now was that how far technologically advanced these nations were? Mind if I ask? What exact information are you really searching for? The old sage asked. Quietness soon took over for a brief moment. The Japanese lieutenant had let out a sigh. Well, we are searching for a safe passageway that will lead us directly to this principality, he said. According to what we know so far, most of the lands near it have been turned into battlefields and military camps. And many destroyed bridges as well, Rory added, getting everyone's attention. It would be a hard time for any envoy or diplomatic team to visit the place for negotiations. You're correct, sir. Cato nodded. But I'm afraid, in order to access the principality nowadays, you'll need to head to its economic port city by the sea. So we're gonna have to take a boat and go around the continent to reach it. Brian clarified. And by doing so, it would prevent any conflict or encounter with whatever army that this empire can throw, Itami said this time. It would be a bad idea for the coalition to just blast their way there. Something like that, Cato said as he slowly rubbed his forehead. At that moment as well, a question came into his mind. Pardon me if I may ask, you said that your encampment was located in the middle of Alnus Hill, the old mage said. How big is the scope of your encampment? Yuji immediately responded to the question. Well, it's about this big Mr. Cato. He placed his finger on the scroll and did a trace marking the entirety of the hill. By the gods, the whole of Almas Hill is a part of your territory, Cato said in surprise. Rory giggled at his statement. Well, that hill is no longer sacred after all. Yet another cryptic message from the young lady. Cato then sighed. I suppose it is possible for your leaders or governing body to accommodate an entire village like Coda. He wanted to believe in such a chance of survival. He'd had the impression since the day he arrived that the village's days were numbered. Not that the first signs were visible, but rather a seed of evil being planted in preparation for something greater to destroy and claim the place. It was a vision that was shared by traveling merchant months back. We will do our best to provide what we have, Lieutenant Brian is sure. Although, that village official back in the meeting hall, is he really serious about what he said about us? He wondered. Oh, ignore that man's buggering, Rory said. Since the day he arrived here, he did nothing but to persuade everyone that the Empire would never harm a fly, she explained. And didn't I mention that he's formerly from Sad Era? What now? All of the three men's attention immediately went towards her, which startled her a bit. Cato sighed once more. It's just our first impressions at first but it did turn out to be true, he added. So is he some kind of higher general or official? Yuji asked, sensing things were getting more interesting. Specifically a noble, a self-exiled one. Kato clarified. Now that's something you don't learn every day, Brian commented. But why he did chose this village specifically? Itami asked. 
A brief moment of quietness took over. Kato just simply shook his head. Truthfully, I have no idea about that, he said, slowly glancing towards Rory. Nor even Rory here, Rory smiled. But of course, we won't let our minds be reckless regarding his suspicious intentions. It was a promise that she had kept. But according to the village chief, without his help, this village would have been gone due to starvation, Yuji added. Kato nodded. Yes, the village suffered a food shortage not long ago, and Marcus willingly offered his help as he claimed to have a connection from wealthy nobles who owned lots of vegetables, meat, and fish farms. He explained, trying to recall what happened after the problem was solved. Eldar accepted his help, and the village was saved from the crisis until it could get back on its feet again. And not long after, he started to tell everyone on how the empire was a victim of lies and devilish propaganda. Rory added, a bit disappointed that she wasn't able to witness the event as she was away from her own travels, and that they were this land's savior, attempting to persuade everybody here that the empire would take care all of them if only they should renounce their customs and beliefs. The mystery began to thicken regarding this Marcus person. It was obvious that there was hidden agenda behind all of this, and that there wasn't much time to investigate further. I swear in Emmer's name that if it's true, I'll take matters into my own hands and give him the honorable death he deserves. Rory forced a sarcastic smile, all the signs of a sarcastic tone on her lips. Rory, please try not to go there, Cato simply said. The young lady shifted into a calmer facade. Oh, I'm just bluffing, no need to worry, I'm not that hot-tempered. The overall presence that the young lady was showing had installed a little bit of worry on the three members of the recon team. Specifically, worry and curiosity. Yuji took note of the girl's mannerisms, the way she moved, her actions, and the way she spoke. It doesn't show her as this normal teenage girl but something else entirely. He couldn't comprehend the mystery surrounding her. It's alright sir, if there will be conflict involving that matter, we'll try to not let it get out of hand. Lieutenant Brian spoke this time. Especially, let a young girl like Ms. Rory get into trouble. The mentioned words slightly annoyed Rory as she was, even more, determined to convince the man to take back his words as she burst into soft laughter. I apologize for the rude interruption, but I believe you are mistaken, sir, she stated. I'm not as young as you all thought I was. Visible confusion ran across the American and Japanese lieutenant's faces. What do you mean by that, miss? Brian asked. You look like you're in your mid to late teens, he commented trying not to sound offending in a way. Kato could only sigh. You wouldn't believe me if I tell you. The old sage then glanced back at Rory. In fact, it's sacred to talk about her real identity. A little snicker came then followed. It's all right, Mr. Kato, but at least could we a clue or a hint who Ms. Rory is really? Itami asked. All eyes then instinctively turned to the so-called young girl. Rory smiled once more as she thought of the words to say if she will be giving them a hint of her true identity. But she took note to herself that she was going to introduce herself in the simplest way possible. And so she stood up straight and gracefully took a small bow. As you may know, my full name is Rory Mercury, and I'm the Oracle of the God, Emr. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
people in his home, specific people, whom he referred to as true friends, were not to lose faith in him. At this time of the day, he bitterly said before heading to investigate who was attempting to communicate with him. By the time he reached the spot, the magical crystal tube came to life and the familiar symbol of the empire flashed before his eyes. The image just remained there, trying to tell him that all his efforts were in vain and that they had taken him for granted. The village official stared at it for a moment, remembering why he was here in the first place. Aside from the crystal device, there was an unusual object that had never been used by any imperial elite soldier or anyone on this continent. A magical weapon with the appearance of a golden smooth bore three barrel, accompanied by a unique draconic design and a long, wooden grip ending in a knob. The man reached for the weapon and gripped it as tight as he can. As he slowly smirked, his mind shifted its focus to a certain person of great importance, the one he had been told to take. Some wise man you are. Chapter End And hello, it's been a long while since the last update. I eventually took a long break from writing due to mental exhaustion and the loss of motivation to write. I really didn't want to know had happened but all the energy and passion just vanished one day and also found myself facing other struggles from real life. So basically, it's a combination of all. The only things that encourage me to continue writing are because of a humble writer that continues to give me encouragement and give me advice, and a reader that kept asking me when will be the next update. And I just wonder why how a reader could be this eager to read an unknown FIC that has a not so good potential. Yet somehow, and because of that, I managed to push myself and finish the chapter for the story to continue. I guess that's something to be proud of I guess. With those thoughts done, let's talk about a little bit of the chapter. There were a lot of scenes that have been cut since I felt that it doesn't fit on the chapter's overall flow. Truthfully, the whole of the Coda Village arc, in my opinion, was abrupt in the manga and anime. They only had a few interactions and then they encounter the flame dragon. So I took a reader's suggestion to expand the arc and give it more extra story and drama. I guess the flame dragon attacking the refugees thing is rather repeated in a lot of fix so I'll be changing that at least in this story. As usual, the chapter focuses more on a small scale and follows the main character's perspectives. Nothing much special in terms of events, but it's more of two groups meeting and getting to know each other. The last scene, however, is much different. The village official has a hidden agenda and I'm curious to see where this will go. Hopefully, I like to get back this kind of motivation soon to write again. That is the last of my thoughts regarding the chapter. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you also for your support and time for reading the story, that means so much and I really appreciate it. 18. Arc 1, A Secret Promise Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Rodinia's Special Chapter, A Secret Promise Never ever he had felt this kind of silence in the air. All throughout his young life, he himself had witnessed the glory that befell every legion or group that had set out the journey to battle enemies, slay demons, or conquer the new lands. The empire had always held these small ceremonies for departing men, and it was adorned with festivities, with families and friends bringing food, musical instruments, and even games to make this an unforgettable event. Some even brought a high priest to pray for the men themselves in order for the god of war to bless them with his own protection so that they would all be safe when engaged in battle. The recent armies that had returned from their campaigns to expand the territories from the north were a strong testimony. The lands of Quila was slowly falling apart. It was early in the morning when Darius, a young nobleman in the middle of his twenties, found himself at the southern part of the empire's walls specifically near the gates of an old watchtower. He had already expected this calm and windy atmosphere that overwhelmed and the rest of the men. The usual imperial soldier's clothing was nowhere to be seen other than the new garb with a very much different design exclusively provided by his home's finest, tailors and silk makers. Whoever had the idea of changing the original design should be praised for the armor is much lighter than the standard bulky iron armors. Furthermore, a close friend from the royal court had given him a small gift of some sort, contained in a wooden box with unique designs, to which he had decided to open later on the journey. Right now, 
he had to oversee the rest of his group, which had been entrusted to him, and as a young leader, he was determined to ensure that everyone was prepared and had time to say their goodbyes to their own families. A smile formed around his lips, seeing the proud eyes of these families towards these men. It was enough to cover one of the truths of humanity's nature. There were men who were treated the same way when they left, but when they returned from their journey, defeated and having failed to achieve their goals, they were mocked, and only their families waited at the bridge or at the gates to welcome them back, even in the midst of their disappointment. It was one of the reasons the young man had asked for only a small ceremony for these men. They were ordinary citizens or even migrants who volunteered to train and serve the empire simply to feed their families. And he always knew that these people didn't need glory or praises to achieve true happiness. As he surveyed more of the surroundings and scenery, he deduced that there were about eighty to ninety men in armor that stood in the fields, gathering themselves and mustering up their old courage back that helped them accomplish the previous missions. Captain Darius! A voice then called to this attention, and he shifted his eyes towards the much younger man in his teens. Most of the horses are ready and good to go, sir. The young man informed the captain. Should I announce to them? Darius smiled. Just give them more time to spend with their families. He told the boy. Yes, captain. The boy nodded, as he left to tend to his own horse. The day had welcomed him with open arms, though his mind went back to the report of a certain fellow noble who had relayed on a message through a rare magic crystal. The supposed target was living in a village somewhere in the Alnus region. According to further details, the individual formerly belonged to that of noble or royal status and is considered a threat when is forced to defend himself. Hmm, interesting. He nodded to himself. Could it really be true that he is the one? In the midst of his thoughts, a new presence had entered the scene and he immediately recognized the newcomer due to the distinctive scent of a certain rare perfume that belonged from the north. I didn't expect you to be here, he said as he turned around to face a beautiful white-haired beauty. She was dressed in a more simple leather outfit that covered very few parts of her body and wearing a kind of strap, which was also made of leather, that covered her neck as a type of accessory. The bright red eyes the fluffy white ears were dead giveaway and at first glance. He thought he had seen that former glory of the fierce queen hailing from the powerful northern tribe. There was a silence that followed after as the young woman had a slightly worried look on her face. The young captain gave a small chuckle and shook his head. For the last time, I'll be keeping my promise, he said as he slowly approached her. The beautiful young woman frowned slightly as she looked away, trying to avoid eye contact as much as possible. Just make sure that you don't get yourself killed there. She told the captain, her expression slowly returning to sorrow. You know that you're the only hope that she has, in getting away from that. I know I know, as soon as I come back from this mission, I'll make sure that her slave title will be transferred to me, give the proper treatment that she deserved and somehow help her reach her home at Alnus Hill. Darius ended his summary with a question that continued to baffle him to this day. Of all the places in this land, why the sacred hill? because that's where she came from and her home belonged to the other side of this world. She repeated her statement one more time. A small chuckle escaped the young man's lips. You seriously believe that story? He inquired, much to his surprise and much to his dismay. That story itself was nothing more than a fabrication to appease the majority of the people. Although, the young woman could only give a serious expression as a response. Very well, he sighed but promise me you'll tell me the real story when I get back. He then requested a small favor. The young woman didn't say a word but only nodded, as her thoughts began to cloud her mind. She felt this fear for the first time as she could see the rest of the people that would be going with him for their so-called mission. She considered herself as a witness to the cries of the women and children that echoed through the cities, and she didn't want to be part of the lines when these band of men returns only a few. For the first time, she found herself afraid of the outcome. No matter what she did to sacrifice every bit of what her power and status could hold just to keep the ones that she cared safe and protected from bad hands. Now she was doing it again for the sake of a friend, who had suffered enough and longed for her home. The young captain just smiled as he placed his hand on her shoulder, and that caught her attention immediately. Don't worry, a promise is a promise, he said while looking straight through her eyes. I'll be back. He smiled as he heard the call of the rest of the men, 
who were now waiting for his signal. See you around, Tayil. Darius smiled as he bid his farewell, proceeding and hopping onto his horse, and instructed the rest of the group to begin the first steps of the journey. All right, men, let's move forward, he declared as the rest of the men marched with their captain while their families watched and also waved their temporary goodbyes to them. The young woman found herself standing in the midst of the small crowd as she took a deep breath afterward. Her gaze only focused on the small imperial army as they headed to the vast lands and forests of the region. A small smile appeared on her lips for the first time somewhere there. She was overcome with joy for her friend, that her friend would be liberated from the dark prison cellars and the occasional secret rooms that she had tried to sabotage numerous times in order for them not to touch her skin. By the time Darius returns from his journey, all of that will be over in an instant. She could feel the latter's story coming to an end, and as fate had placed her, she would resume the responsibility of keeping her safe from the scoundrels of both courts. At least, that was her role in the story from the start. However, in her case, a different story is to be told for another time. Chapter End And I've been really debating with myself whether I should introduce a certain character early in the story arc, but I thought why not write a sneak peek regarding it? Thus this chapter came to fruition. With that said, thank you for your support and giving time into reading the chapter, Smiley Face. 18. Arc 1, Kota Village Part 3. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Rodinius. Chapter 8, First Contact. Kota Village Part 3. It was the constant aches that continued to plague his head. Not even the softest pillow and coziest bed that he had laid on were enough to ease that pain. He wasn't sure if it was just his leg that was injured when tragedy struck his home. By the time, his hands moved around his forehead. He felt the familiar soft fabric of the bandage. It only added to his confusion as he began to wonder if he had landed on something that would cause that mysterious injury. His memory was not helping him as everything was vague and hazy when he tried to recall every detail of the event. Hotter inhaled deeply as he lay motionless on his bed. The light from the open window served as his guide as he surveyed the entire room. He had to admit that the room was more comfortable than his previous one in the woods. The fresh air that came in made a significant difference, providing him with a cooler environment. He had never felt so relaxed and at ease before, and the elf man was grateful to the villagers who had provided him with this spare room, as well as to his daughter who had been taking care of him for the past several days because the village itself was short on healers and nurses. The image of her walking out the door in silent frustration lingered in his mind after what appeared to be a harmless joke about an ale to relieve his headaches and the phrase that came out of his mouth, which didn't help him all that much. What did I say? When he finally realized what he had done, it was too late. The naive tone in his voice was the final straw for the girl as he witnessed the door slam shut right in front of his face. He sighed as he remembered that moment. Oh, I'm sorry, Arena, he muttered, apologizing to his late wife for not knowing how to be a good father and all. He could feel the aches coordinating together just to keep him laying on his bed, but fortunately, his own father instincts were stronger than that, and the man was able to raise his body halfway and the next thing he knew, he was now resting his back on the wooden wall. He sighed and took another deep breath. He had no idea it was so difficult to simply stand up. For a strong and sleek man like him, he should have been standing by now. But he was still trying to regain the sense that had left him before. He could smell the cooked and enticing aroma of a certain wooden bowl of soup placed on a small table next to his bed. Soon after, his memory came back to him and he remembered how his daughter was struggling just to feed him properly as if he were a whiny toddler. The bowl of soup was half finished, prompting him to recall the precise moment his daughter walked out of the room without saying anything. As a result, it has now become a very embarrassing situation for him. He kept taking in his surroundings, attempting to figure out where he was. He was so disoriented that he couldn't remember what he had done the previous day or the day before that. The only thing he could remember was walking on this empty highway with his daughter while the sunset was directly in front of him before his vision was obscured by darkness. Hada rubbed his eyes and rubbed his face as he resolved to finally leave this room in search of his daughter. When he removed the blankets that had been covering his legs, 
he discovered that his old battle pants had been replaced by a regular pair. That also made him wonder about the person who had replaced his pants, which was quickly becoming an inappropriate thought. To counteract the redness on his cheeks, the elf man placed his feet on the ground, where he felt a slight ache in his right leg. He could stand up because it wasn't too painful, but limping was a better word to describe his journey towards the door. By the time he reached for the knob, the door had burst open, and he was confronted with an old lady carrying a small tray with a single cup of tea in the center. Oh, I apologized. I didn't mean to. Miss Elena, is that you? He widened his eyes in surprise as he recognized the elderly lady in her sixties. The elderly lady, known as Elena, simply smiled. Oh my goodness, you're finally awake, she then added. It's been a long time since I've seen such a handsome elf who hasn't changed since my younger days, she remarked. The elf man continued to stare at her with disbelief. W what am I? How did I get here? Hodder wasn't sure if this was the right question to ask, but it was the only thing bothering him for a long time, and he might finally get the answer he was looking for. You're in Kota Village, dear. The elderly lady responded by entering the room and setting the tray on the table. When your daughter brought you here, you were unconscious, she elaborated. Fortunately, my husband had found you a spare room. Oh, Eldar. He sighed and looked around him. I understand, ma'am, but whose room is this? He inquired. Elena chuckled. Well, to be honest, this is anyone's room. She went on to explain. In fact, you're the first person in years to sleep inside one of the village hall's rooms. Hodder blinked for a couple of times. Oh, I see. He said this as he attempted to leave the room, but not before the old lady stopped him by raising her hand to his face. You're not going anywhere after that horrible injury. Elena made a very strict expression on her face, much to the elf man's surprise. Mrs. Elena, just wanted to let you know that I'm fine and can walk properly. Crap that hurt. He was making good progress with his explanations before taking another step with his right leg. But, no you don't. The wife of the village elder stated once more. Your daughter told me to keep an eye on you because you keep asking her for ale and booze, and that's not how you recover. She went on to explain. It was all a joke, ma'am. Hodder tried to reason it out as his hope dwindled by the second. I never meant what I said to her before. He added. Elena shook her head again. There will be no buts and excuses, she said with a small smile. You'll be staying here until you've recovered and finished your tea. Despite knowing the old woman for a long time, Hodder's mind was now in a minor conflict. He had no choice but to respect her statement. He returned his gaze to the hot tea waiting for him to drink it, and after a brief sigh he said, All right, I'll stay. The village elder's wife responded with a nod. Wonderful, she said it cheerfully. The elf man could only force a smile. In the back of his mind, he was already questioning the highest of power on how he could have ended up in such an impossible situation. The gods must be crazy for this. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Do you mean this girl was the one who turned Karada into this? Mari was perplexed. It was difficult to believe unless there was evidence. Fortunately, Higashi remembered pulling out his phone, as his fellow recon member had encouraged him to do, and was able to record the exact moment it occurred. Um, sort of, but I think this might persuade you, Mari-san. The JSDF recon soldier said this as he pulled out his phone and showed her the evidence he had gathered. Meanwhile, the two teenage girls' curiosity peaked as they shifted their gaze to the small black box that the two friendly green visitors were currently inspecting. Lele's interest gradually grew as a part of her prayed for the opportunity to examine the black box. A few seconds later, familiar voices such as Luke's and his friends, Tuka's, and her own began to emerge from the small box. How did it manage to capture and produce our voices? The young mage thought to herself, wondering what type of magic does this small box was showing. Mari, on the other hand, kept glancing back and forth from the smartphone to the blonde girl, trying to visualize how would a teenage girl perform that kind of move to a bigger man. Fortunately, her doubts and skepticism were quickly dispelled when she saw the footage of Karata being slammed on the ground in mere seconds. It was just pure surprise and disbelief running through her mind. And as a result, she was now able to say, Thank you Higashi, I believe you now. She smiled towards the man. And you said that she was an elf? The JSDF soldier immediately nodded. That's what Karada and I saw. I mean just the pointy ears and all. He explained, giving a sigh as he thought he was going crazy. I see. Mari said before adding, well, why don't you check on Karada for the meantime and I'll try to talk to the girls. She told the man, who nodded in return. At the same time she was about to approach the two girls, another familiar presence had entered the small tent and came in Shino Kurabayashi, with one of her usual entrances. Hey Mari, just want to let you know we finished everything so far and... What the heck happened to you Karada? The powerful voice of the young tough lady startled the rest of everyone, and all of their attention shifted to her. A brief moment of silence followed as confusion began to take over her mind. She was gone for about ten minutes, and by the time she returned back, a new situation formed and came to greet her as soon as she entered the tent. Mari smiled at her friend, Um Shino. I think you've got a lot to catch up on, she explained, motioning for her to turn her attention to the two newcomers. As soon as the latter looked at the two girls, who were unsure how to react. Oh, sorry about that. By the way, my name is Shino. The young lady smiled as she quickly apologized for her bombastic entrance, which the two girls eventually accepted. It's all right, Miss Shino. The blue-haired girl responded with a small smile. It's nice to meet you. The blonde elf girl followed after. Shino raised both eyebrows as she was a little surprised that the two girls were able to take this situation very calmly and seriously. Usually people would feel a bit intimidated by her presence for the first time. Nice to meet you two girls. Mind telling me what exactly happened to him over there? Quietness took over once more. There was a bit of awkwardness between the two, and Lele could look at her friend, who was trying to summarize everything that had happened but only managed to do so with a few words and a nervous grin. It's a very long story. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The elderly lady was at a loss for words as she clutched both of her hands tightly in grief. Koan Village was a lovely place where she had many happy memories. When she was younger and the village was new to the area, the village's humble wood elves would visit her village on a regular basis to trade and build good relations. During that time, she and her husband met Hodder and his family, and the rest is history, a family friendship that has lasted to the present day. Hodder could only look down as he felt a pang of guilt deep within him. He was relieved that he had contributed to the survival of the majority of the population, but he regretted that he had not been able to prevent the destruction of his home. The miraculous persuasion of the village elders was just a consolation prize for him. He wished he could go back in time and undo all of his rash decisions. His home was forever gone. He sighed once more as he took a sip of his own tea, while the conversation continued on. She's grown into a strong young lady. Elena described the old woman as overwhelmed with surprise and pride when she first saw her at the previous village meeting. I'd never seen such bravery from her to testify in front of the jury, even though she was battered and exhausted. Hodder's eyes widened with surprise. You mean she testified at your village meeting? He inquired, and the elderly lady simply nodded in response. Yes, my husband and I tried to tell her to rest, but she refused. She explained, recalling how rocky the entire duration of her testimony had been, with the sudden pauses and sentences and the visible trauma on her eyes, despite the fact that she was able to control herself and finish testifying. As a result, it did enlighten the villagers about the deteriorating safety of the land on which they had been living for years. It wasn't just the threat of wandering raiders or imperial soldiers, but also the threat of the region's violent dragons and other creatures. The elf man's heart continued to sink as the village chief's wife continued to tell her more about the situation while he was in a comatose-like state. He was grateful to learn that the local village blacksmith, artisans, and small food taverns had provided her everything that she needed. A new set of wonderful clothes, bows and arrows, something that he wished he could provide to her back then. It was then he had realized that he had a long way and a lot to make it up for her. Tell me, dear, what is your daughter's name again? Elena asked, as her memory failed her this time. There was a brief moment of silence before the man moved his lips and mentioned her name. And sure enough, he felt this sense of pride. Her name is Tuka. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the adolescent girl took a deep breath and proceeded to give her own explanation based on what she had learned and the rare creatures she had seen with her own eyes. The majority of the Alnus region is home to various types of dragons, she stated. There are three categories to classify them based on what I've learned in my studies. She took a brief pause, recalling those three keywords. There are three types of dragons, common dragons, ancient dragons, and hybrid dragons. As the situation progressed into more of a mini-history lesson, the area fell silent. I see, what are the common dragons then? The girl took another deep breath. Common dragons are the usual wyverns that kingdoms use for patrolling and battle. She went on to explain. They are also wild wyverns that live in mountainous areas rich in magical elements emitted by veins in the underlying rock. Their color shades range from green to red to brown. She paused for a moment to catch her breath. These wild wyverns, or the majority of them living in these lands, have now been converted and merged into the empire's daily activities. She went on to explain, as well as the other remaining kingdoms. So they were domesticated? The same thought ran through the minds of the remaining recon members inside the tent. While the young girl continued her story, ancient dragons, on the other hand, are a different breed. She continued, they are one of the most powerful and terrifying types of dragons. She continued, From what I've learned so far, only two types of these ancient dragons exist on this continent. One lives in the largest caves in the Northwest Mountains, while the other thrives on water. However, there were small families who lived in the forests. Lele paused for a few moments to allow the others to process the information. There were, in fact, more than two breeds or types. The far more dangerous ones can be found across the Great Orient. The most far-fetched story she had heard was that of an ancient powerful dragon sealed in a volcano due to nearly destroying a whole kingdom. And just as she was about to continue, the astute Shino Kurabayashi spoke up. Hybrid dragons, I believe we have a pretty good idea what those creatures could be. She trailed off, a grin on her face. Thank you so much for the information, she stated. It's like I'm back in history class. She then reflected within herself, just realized how interesting this was, and this wizard-looking girl explains the information better than her professors at the university ever did. Oh, I see. Lale blinked in surprise but eventually accepted it. As she was about to add more important facts, she was suddenly interrupted. Um, excuse me Lale san In the middle of that, the voice of Karada, who was still on his makeshift bed, called out to the girl which also garnered everyone's attention. Is it okay if I could ask a question? He said as his statement received a slight cringe expression from the busty young woman. Go ahead, mister. Lele nodded. As little anticipation grew within them, the quietness returned. For the blue-haired teen, the man's curiosity and the way he spoke indicated that he was eager to learn something. Are there any dragons in this world that can talk and transform into humans and also occasionally serve you as nice and beautiful maids? With that said, everyone's mind went blank before the majority of them face-bombed. A question is so strange that Lele and even Tuka had difficulty coming up with an answer. However, the concept and idea in it were truly unique in their own right. Back in our world, we have those types of dragons but only on TVs and stuff, if you know what I mean. Mari and Higashi could feel their sweats dripping as they, too, were cringing at the moment, while Shino chose to simply face bomb. It was almost expected of him to ask a question that was often related to his culture. Uh, here we go again. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
After completing his task of providing food for the elderly and children, Hitoshi was assigned, along with Tomita and the others, to assist local village merchants and stall owners in loading their goods onto their respective wagons. He could feel sweat dripping down his chin as he carried heavy baskets and sacks containing mostly farm vegetables. It reminded him of his days as a chef in a well-known restaurant in Tokyo. He needed to check on a slew of boxes and packages of ingredients, all of which were as heavy as this. Furthermore, since arriving in this world, he has become increasingly curious about the types of dishes that exist here, and to his surprise, there hasn't been much of a difference so far. The ingredients used to cook food by the locals were the same, with the only major difference being how they cooked it. He wouldn't describe it as old school right away, but rather as a very unique and creative way of preparing food here. He did try to search up if there was any restaurant, or at least a food establishment in this village. He was curious to learn more about their conditions. And much to his disappointment, there were none but only small food stalls or carts scattered around the area, and fortunately, the food that these small stalls served were surprisingly familiar and were revealed to be simple deep-fried marinated dishes of chicken, fish, pork and even vegetables, which reminded him of the dishes served in one of the street food markets back in Tokyo. It was one of the parallels he had noticed and would have looked into further if it hadn't been for his tasks. Say, young man, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for helping us. A voice interrupted the JSDF soldier's thoughts as the local village merchant that he was currently assisting approached him. Oh, it's no problem, sir, just doing our job to help whatever we can, he replied. The village merchant nodded. I see, it's been a while since I've seen a group of people who are willing to help from the bottom of their hearts, he remarked. And may I ask you a question? Are you the one who prepared that delectable dish? he inquired. Hitoshi paused for a moment before nodding. Um, yes, sir, he said. That's fantastic. My nephew had brought me a small bowl. And I must say that with that level of culinary skill, you are qualified to cook for the world's great kings and emperors. With a genuine grin, the village merchant proudly said to the young man. The old man's statement surprised Hitoshi. Sure, he cooked for celebrities or famous people who visited his previous restaurant on occasion, but to cook for presidents, kings, and emperors was a whole other level. And to be at that level, he had to have the powers of all the world's greatest chefs to achieve that. Chefs like Marco Pierre White, Senji Yamamoto, Gordon Ramsay, and others have achieved that feat. To himself, he was no god of cookery, but that of a humble aspiring human cook, who wanted to give his own contributions and help whatever he can. Surely, in this world, he had a reason to be very determined about the main goals. Like the rest of his fellow recon members, he had sworn in to protect anyone who is in dire situations. Naming a restaurant after people who died in their honor was insufficient, or perhaps a cheap way to accomplish it. The longer they live and are able to witness it, the better their legacy will be. I'm no legendary cook, sir. I just want to serve and cook for those in need, Hitoshi explained. At least, that's what I wanted to do nowadays. The old man gave a little chuckle. That's the exact same thing that a friend once said to me, a very unique friend with a hot temper, he said. The young man raised both his eyebrows. Oh, does your friend aspire to cook too? He asked. The old merchant sighed, recalling that certain person who had helped him before. Well, he had the same dream as you and he was able to achieve it in just a span of three to four years. He explained. The last time I saw him, he told me he was going to find his way back home across the Great Orient. He added. Interesting, Hitoshi muttered, as his curiosity continued to grow. Though as he was about to ask a question regarding this mysterious cook, the older man, had beaten him to it. Say young man, this place that we are going to, is it a good place where I can grow a farm? He asked. For a brief moment, there was silence as the young JSDF soldier contemplated how to respond to this. The last time he saw the fields surrounding the main base, they were littered with dead bodies and the carcasses of wyvern dragons killed during an attempted assault by a large army of mercenaries. Will our journey be safe? The village merchant followed another, showing a hint of worry. Hitoshi had no right to expect a safe journey. Certainly, there is always the possibility of conflict arising. 
However, the only thing he could do was reassure the old man that everything was going to be alright. No worry sir, my group and I will make sure that your families will be safe and protected. He flashed a confident smile. Thank you for your kind words, young man. The gods will guarantee blessing to you and your people. Those words really did put him in a good mood, but he could still feel that kind of uncertainty inside. For the time being, he hoped that base camp would reach them and learn about their current situation. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He wasn't sure if the aerial recon teams had taken another village, but they had insisted that this was the exact same spot. The river and the layout of the village. The same feeling of surprise and shock overwhelmed when his team had first stumbled upon the village and for the first time in years. He felt freaked out regarding this mystery. Did something happen in this village before? As a result, more headaches and confusion ensued. I hope, I'm not losing my mind. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
A brief moment of silence befell the area. Cato gave a little chuckle in response. In fact, he too didn't know where to start. The young lady had that centuries-old history with her, yet still, not a lot of people are aware of her true identity. To be honest Sir Yuji, even I don't know that much surrounding her past, he explained. It's often common for people to doubt and question once they first learn of her true identity. He added, and I'm just part of them. Trust me, if she wanted to prove her point, she will do it. The old man flashed a small smile. It's only a matter of patience. Makes sense I guess. Yuji could only sigh. The first time the young lady had introduced herself, she did not present any proof or evidence just, not even the slightest of hints. It was a normal but graceful introduction like any other, except for the fact that she made promise to present that evidence when the time is finally right. I haven't quite told you this young man but when I first met her, I was only but a young delinquent student studying at the academy, and believe it or not, she was once my teacher. He gave off another chuckle. Yuji was still left in disbelief. It sounds so far-fetched yet the old man was treating this as if it really happened. So what made you convinced that she was really him, an apostle? Kato smiled. Hmm, just a small story to be told in another time. Yuji nodded in understanding, as he returned his gaze towards the young lady. He couldn't help but sense something which was secretly bothering her. In the middle of another silence, the old man suddenly stood up, having remembered one last task to do. If you may excuse me, young man, I will be heading back to the village hall for one more meeting with the chief. Sure thing, sir, Yuji replied as he assisted the old sage on standing up. Thank you, and a small favor if you don't mind, please tell Rory and the rest of your friends to head back to the main plaza. Once you're all finished with the task, Kato informed him as a wave of seriousness took over his face. I will. Yuji simply nodded, noticing the change of emotion from the old sage, which left him in wonder until he fully realized what was exactly going on. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the first time they had ever seen an animal that could actually understand what they were saying. Are we in a Disney movie right now? Carl commented. The new problem had plagued their minds now, as they ponder on what to do next in order to make it up for the poor birds. Fortunately enough, they were quick in their thinking and they were able to make amends. Carl gazed upon the giant bird he was guiding, and he quickly noticed the frown and sulking expression of the bird, as if it was expecting something for him to do. The American ranger scratched his head and smiled nervously. Hey, I'm really sorry for what I did, and I didn't mean to hurt you. He said this as he began to gently caress the bird. It was a mistake, and I hope you will forgive me. A brief moment of quietness took over and not long after, the giant bird made another quay sound and gently let its front head touch the man's hand as a sign of forgiveness. The other men, who were watching the whole thing unfold, decided to do the same thing as the latter and change their approach. To their surprise, the move went smoothly, and they were all able to properly guide the chocobos to the wagons. Following that, a sense of relief filled the air. Rory never felt this much proud for her new friends. Wonderful, she uttered. It really warms my heart that you men have the hearts to be gentle after all, she added. And you should be also doing that your respective lovers as well. She gave a playful grin. Itami sighed after hearing her statement. He cringed for a little bit as an image of a certain woman flashed before his eyes and he felt this sense of regret for not keeping the relationship in full health. He wasn't the only person having the same feeling right now. Through Rory's eyes, she could tell that the men had this awkward expression on their faces, and all their cheeks were reddening, as if it seemed that they were not the perfect gentlemen in their past. A small puzzlement took over, and the young lady wondered, do they not have their own goddess of love in their world? Or she is just not doing her job properly? In the middle of her thoughts, her attention shifted towards the old sage who had now left the area after conversing with the young chronicler. She noticed a very serious facade on the old man's face, and that raised her own concern. Whenever the old man possessed that expression, it only meant that something terrible was going to happen and that directly led her to her suspicions which were now coming true, and not too long enough, the young chronicler arrived with a message. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and after those years, the time had finally come for them to relocate to greener pastures, this time with the assistance of the men in green. The new visitors arrived with their unique horseless carriages and a kind of assistance that they did not expect. A smile crept upon his lips for the first time. Throughout his life as village chief, he had never seen such people, who are willing to help and provide. Rarely, the village had received any help throughout its year-long existence. Every land or place they settled unto, their community would also be driven by something unlucky or disastrous. It was a never-ending cycle. As a result, his only son had had enough and moved away from the village with his wife and daughter in favor of a larger town and community that can sustain and survive for many years. The only drawback was that the old man had lost contact with him, and it had been several years since he had last spoken to him. I wish you were to see this, he muttered to himself, and then recapping what the men in green had told him about their plan earlier. The endearing part of their plan was that the whole of Code of Village, and the villagers will be protected from harm and be provided with a place that they can treat as their possible permanent home. It was a very wonderful promise, and the men in green had vowed to fulfill it, and do whatever they can to ensure a safe future for this community. The announcement regarding that matter was received well by the majority of villagers, and as of now, they were all preparing for another journey towards this so-called promised land or perhaps their final one. An hour had already passed as he waited for a certain sage. This was the only time they could conduct this small and secret meeting while most of everybody was busy outside, and without the presence of any suspicious individuals or watchful eyes. A lot of people had already warned him regarding a certain village official. The wind outside grew stronger as it entered through the open window and fresh air filled the entire room. At the same time, the village chief could feel drowsiness in him rising and he was now contemplating on taking just a short nap to rest his mind and body. As his eyes were slowly shutting down, there was a sudden sharp and powerful noise that had unexpectedly rung through like thunder. Boom! All of a sudden strong vibrations rocked the room. Eldar immediately opened his eyes as his drowsiness was eliminated in mere seconds. The old man jolted up from his seat as he began to look around and attempt to comprehend what had just happened. What in the world? He muttered to himself, pushing himself to walk towards the door while he could feel his heart beating faster. As he neared his destination, he could hear the faint sobs of a woman followed by what seemed to be a male voice speaking. As moments passed by, his worry began to skyrocket, which encouraged him to investigate more. Is everything all right? He called out as he finally neared the door and reached for the knob. And at that moment, the door burst open revealing a very familiar face. The village chief's eyes widened as he came face to face with someone he hadn't expected to see. The man before him narrowed his eyes as he gave a devious smile as his own way of greeting. Finally, his prediction was right all along. Marcus, what was that trembling noise outside? And what are you doing here? Eldar worriedly asked waiting for an explanation and response. However, the village official just stood there as he refused the old man's pleas. Instead, he closed the door behind and drew out a golden object, and pointed it at the man. I apologize for this surprise visit old man, but I wish to request a meeting with you, the man said, as he slowly forced the concerned old man back to his seat, to discuss a very important matter. Eldar, on other hand, was visibly confused about what was happening. He knew his life was at risk so he did what the man had told him to. His eyes focused on the golden material that the latter was holding. It looked like a handle of some sort and it had the design of an ancient dragon. Marcus, please, what is going on? Sit down. His attempt for please was silenced once more and coincidentally, he found his way back onto his chair and immediately sat down. Good. The village official smiled with a strange satisfaction. Afterward, he drew out a certain scroll, unsealed it, and placed it on the table, for the old village chief to see. As soon as the old man laid sight on the contents of the scroll and its symbol, he widened his eyes in terror. That's... No, what are you planning to do? Eldar asked and demanded. Stay calm, Sir Eldar. I don't have any bad intentions in hurting the villagers or letting this village be in trouble. Marcus explained as he gazed at the symbol on the scroll. However, if you fail to cooperate and understand the goal of this, then I am afraid, this village's demise is solely to blame on you. 
he smirked. One drop of blood will signal the end of this entire place, the man said as he could feel himself gaining the upper hand. Silence befell the room, as the old village chief kept quiet. Marcus examined the magnificent object on his hand. No one has ever wielded this kind of weapon. From fellow nations from the north, this is a state of the art. He was in awe himself. It's damage powerful as an archmage magical attack, and faster than any ballista or crossbow. He then shifted his eyes towards the old man. It's such a shame that my home hasn't realized this kind of advantage he commented, bitterly narrowing his eyes. They're too fixated on the old customs and beliefs. Marcus. Eldar tried to call the man, but the latter completely ignored him. That's why they couldn't finish this hundred-year-long conquest immediately, and can't even stand up against that forsaken arrogant empire. Marcus, don't you understand why I'm doing this Eldar, he said, as he slightly approaches the man. Everything is changing. A new age of innovation and ideas has arrived and Sad Era will fully embrace it soon. We are on a path to greatness, he smiled. And because of this village's kindness, and how this place saved me from death, I want it to be spared and become a part of that change, he explained, looking down at the old man once more. What do you say? Never ever has Sad Era mistreated and abused the places that they have conquered nor ever had the audacity to destroy a village like this, he said and hoped. Believe me, Kota Village will have a bright future with Sad Era. The man concluded his statement as he waited for the old man's thoughts on this. Surely by now, he would come to realize that they were in good hands. But unfortunately, the situation headed to a different outcome. Eldar kept his seriousness and narrowed his eyes towards the younger village official. What is it you really want? He asked once more. Seemingly had no interest on further speeches and other topics. Quietness took over yet again. Marcus maintained his confidence as he let out another smirk. You're very persistent, old man, he said as he began walking back and forth. It's simple, besides my proposal, there's a person that I'm eager to talk to privately, he explained. I really did admire him when I was still a child but it's such as waste that he had renounced his title and left to pursue his own interests. He added, what are you trying to tell here? Eldar asked. You know what I meant, old man. Marcus replied, I know, you've been pretending and purposely not aware of his identity. Marcus, what or why? Enough of the cluelessness. I know he's on his way here, the man said before adding, and truthfully, I have so many questions to ask him. The village official commented, there was this excitement that continued to rise within him. How ironic that he was also living another life just like him. Did he try to leave behind his past as well? But first, I would really love to test the power of this unique weapon, he said observing the object once more. A moment later an idea came up to his mind and thus he let out a smirk, to show you how this will be the starting point for that change. Once he finished his sentence, Marcus raised the weapon and aimed it at the door itself, but in a surprising coincidence, the door suddenly opened and a familiar presence had finally arrived. A surprised Eldar widened his eyes as he let his desperation take over him. Kato, don't enter further. He tried to warn him, but unfortunately, he was too late. As soon as the old sage took the first step, Marcus pressed the trigger finally releasing the weapon's capabilities. A rotating blue glyph then materialized in front of the barrel followed by a frightening thunderous-like sound that erupted from it, and not too long. A blue energy-like orb emerged from the glyph and headed towards the old sage with incredible speed. Fortunately, Kato was able to anticipate it, and using his staff which began to glow, he was able to deflect the energy-like orb, which collided with the other door, causing a small explosion that left a huge burning hole in the middle of it. I told you, Marcus muttered, grinning from ear to ear as he found himself looking at a once respectable and known figure of the Sadran royal court. Cato, for his part, wiped the dust from his shoulder casually while staring at the village official. His doubts and suspicions were now confirmed as being the result of what the demigoddess had warned him about. Is this how you welcome your elders, Marcus? Chapter End And hello there once again. So I finally managed to finish another chapter after the last one. I'm not really sure what drove me but I guess it's these readers and writers who continue to push me to write and continue the story. 
and it still surprises me that many are still reading the story up to this point, and I'm grateful for that. So a bit of a discussion regarding the chapter, as usual, there are scenes, which did not make it through as I felt it didn't go with the flow of the chapter. Moreover, from this point on, the Coda Village arc will now progress to the end as the plot is almost nearing the climax. So there might be a battle scene happening in the next chapters, and that means it will take me more than three weeks to get the pieces together to create a calm before the storm and the aftermath of the storm. As for the scenes in the chapter, it's still small and close to the perspective of the characters. One of the toughest parts is getting into their personalities, switching from this end to that so that I can portray how they act or speak. Something tells me that the next couple of chapters would definitely give me a headache in choreographing the small battle scene. If you guys want a hint of what they would be dealing with, I guess the scroll that Marcus placed on the table is a good clue. With that said I guess this is the last of my thoughts regarding the chapter. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language. Thank you also for your support and time for reading the story. That means so much, and I really appreciate it. 18. Arc 1, Kota Village Part 4 Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Lands of Rodinius, Kota Village Part 4 Whenever things were going well and according to plan, there's always this minor hiccup that would ruin everything, and the next thing you know, hell has opened its gates again to invite you. New World Journal, Guest Room, Village Hall I'm so sorry for what happened to Arena. Yet another word of apology came out from the old woman's lips. If I've known earlier regarding her illness, I would have asked Kato for help. She explained, recalling the last time she had seen the wonderful elf woman. She couldn't help herself but noticed the silence that enveloped her. As if she was indeed hiding something. No matter how weak the latter state was during that time, she still managed to bring up every time she would visit the village. Hodder slightly forced a small smile. The elf man didn't really want to revisit those sorrowful and colorless days as he was on his way to a self-destructive path during that time. Adding the fact that he wasn't there for his daughter, who also had suffered the same emotional pain as him. You don't have to apologize, Mrs. Elena. He responded as he placed his now empty cup on the small wooden table beside him. It happened a long time ago, and there's nothing we can do, he went on to say. At the very least, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from it. He finished his sentence with a twinge of guilt in his eyes. The village chief's wife nodded slowly. I understand Hodder, she said, looking down at the ground. Her thoughts were drawn to a brief struggle. She wasn't sure whether to let her emotions out and cry for the loss of a dear friend. But the recent struggles that the village had faced, her husband's poor health, and many other factors had greatly affected her emotions to the point where she had almost lost the ability to cry. And she had been staying in this position where she had to muster all of her strength in her every day if she were not to experience this kind of pain. At the fact that her son's recent departure fueled her distress from within. Even at this age of her life, she would still worry for a loved one that has already moved on. And she understood the motivations and reasons behind that. I'm sorry about what happened to your son. Hodder spoke the words that had been floating around in her head at that precise moment, which surprised her. How did you know? She asked, placing a hand on her lips thereafter. The man blinked a few times in confusion before realizing the meaning of the old lady's question. Oh, I guess I haven't informed you yet, but Eldar himself told me about it. He added, when he visited me on the first day, I was confined in this room. Oh, I see. She muttered. My husband? How come I can't seem to remember? Elena had a thought. She had to keep an eye on her husband at times. He could no longer walk long distances and couldn't handle his duties as chief of the village, at the same time, unless she was missing something. Hada was in no position to speculate. Sometimes people simply lose sight of what is going on around them. In fact, the village chief did pay him a visit, and they had a brief conversation about how each of their lives was going and that was the end of it. A minor occurrence smack dab in the middle of a larger one that he was completely unaware of. Being trapped inside this room for days had kept him from knowing what was going on outside, and he had never heard about the new visitors who were changing the fate of this village. 
Elena was about to inform him about the recent event when she was abruptly interrupted by a startling noise outside in the form of a small explosion. Boom asterisk. The sudden noise interrupted both of their thoughts, and the room fell silent for the first time. Anxiety and tension gradually began to rise as a result. Their attention was drawn to the door, and the older woman was the first to stand. Her husband was the first thing that came to mind, as she was aware that the old man was inside his office room, waiting for a meeting to begin. The mysterious small explosion itself was the second thought. The obvious question to ponder was what or who could have caused it. The sound reminded Hodder of something he'd heard before. He knew he'd heard that sound before, no matter how hazy his memory was. The smell of burning wood had entered the room in no time. Oh no, Eldar. Elena had uttered her husband's name as she eventually decided to leave the room to check on the situation outside, but not before the elf man stood up, ignoring his own injury to keep the latter from walking into a potentially dangerous path. Mrs. Elena, please, it could be dangerous outside, Hodder said as he limped through the elderly lady. And my husband, he's alone in his office, Elena explained, her mind racing with worst-case scenarios such as a possible attack by a dangerous unknown assailant, or even an imperial assassin infiltrating the village. She could feel the desperation clinging to her, and the hesitation was slowly dissipating to the point where she didn't care what might happen if she went ahead. Hodder abruptly interrupted her once more as she chose to accept her own temptation. The elf man lightly rested his hand on her shoulder. Mrs. Elena, please, please allow me to speak first, he stated before adding, so that I can ensure the coast is safe and that whatever is outside will not harm you. He looked her in the eyes and tried to persuade her that he was dead serious about this. But Hodder, you're hurt, she expressed her concern. The elf man simply nodded. I understand but you have to trust me on this one. He reassured the elderly lady by giving her a confident smile. Don't be concerned. Everything will be fine. He went on to say. Having said that, the elf man went with the flow as he passed by the village chief's wife and grabbed the knob. There was a brief moment of silence as the man bit his lower lip before quickly opening the door. When the door finally opened, the two were greeted by a surprising silence and the rest of the empty first floor hallway. After a brief pause, Hodder took the first few steps outside the door, followed by Elena from behind. The eerie silence was the defining creepiness of it all. They had no idea where it came from, and the smell of burning wood was still strong. Elena could feel the tension as the old lady brought her trembling hands and gripped the elf man's back. She was convinced that something terrible was happening right now. As the two continued down the corridor, Another deafening noise rang out in the form of that alleged small explosion. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
It's all part of our training, Ms. Mercury, I mean, Rory, Brian replied, recalling the girl's request to be addressed by her given name. He didn't need to question it because he knew the so-called young oracle was serious. Yuji maintained his own silence, his mind pondering her recent statement. His gaze remained fixed on the black-haired young lady. Is she telling the truth? He reflected himself. The warning she had given him and the others about Marcus, the village official who had expressed opposition to the plan. It was unclear whether she could truly see into the future. There was literally no time for explanations or going into greater detail because events were moving at such a rapid pace. According to Cato, the only thing they could do right now was trust her warning and prepare for what would happen next. There was a glimmer of truth in that matter, and it was gradually revealing itself as time passed. Are we certain that Marcus is the one who is causing all of this from behind now? Atami then inquired. Rory only nodded. Yes, I'm certain about that. She responded. He's always been plotting something since he came into this village. She elaborated. And the current situation proves it. With all due respect, miss, but how do you know about his intentions? Lieutenant Brian was the one to ask this time, leaning a little more to the logical side of things. It felt as if something was missing. Well, she is an oracle for a reason, Yuji had commented, reminding them about her occupation. In response, Rory chuckled and gave a small smile. It's simple. I assigned an underling to monitor the man and his activities, she stated. Underling? What do you mean, Rory? A confused Atami asked this time. Yet another unexpected statement coming from the oracle, that just keeps fueling the mystery even more. A brief moment of silence took over for confusion to take the minds of the rest. Yuji continued to stare at the young lady with puzzled eyes. Since when did the girl have a spy tasked with watching every move of a single suspicious man? Neither the old sage nor any of their previous discussions had mentioned it. For all he knew, the main plan was for Eldar to give that specific signal so that they and the rest could act. Rory smiled once more. Well, my little assistant is currently at the village hall doing the said task, and hopefully you'll be able to cross paths with him later. She explained, cheerfully clasping both of her hands together. Man, Ms. Rory, you're full of surprises, Carl said while scratching the back of his head. The young lady only giggled in response. Oh my, thank you. Brian sighed as he turned on the engine. The light-armored vehicle roared to life as soon as he flipped the key, and just as he was about to step on the pedals, the engines died. What the? The man tried again to start the vehicle, but it still wouldn't cooperate with him. As moments passed by, it became more of a struggle which paved the way for more frustration and disappointment. You've got to be kidding me. He said this frustratedly, attracting the attention of the others. Hey, everything all right, Bree? Carl asked his big brother. Goddamn truck won't start. He simply stated that he was doing everything he could to start the vehicle. Itami raised both eyebrows. But it was working fine just a while ago, he said, bringing up his own surprise and confused expression as well. It was impossible for such a powerful and fast military vehicle to fail in such a manner. There has to be a reason or explanation for this. Was it really a problem with the engine? Or something more akin to a kind of supernatural intervention? The American lieutenant bit his lower lip. Damn, why did this have to happen now? The struggle was unmistakably approaching, and as much as he wished to hasten the situation, he found himself trapped in a potentially endless cycle. Um, this is Carl from RCT Actual. We're kind of experiencing technical difficulties, so please bear with us for a minute. His younger brother went on to inform the other group. It was clearly a frustrating thing that just came up from nowhere, and of course, there was still the backup option, in the form of running through the portion of forest towards the main village area. Though, the only problem was that it was a liability right now. When their hopes were now starting to dwindle, an idea suddenly came out. Why don't we take a ride on one of those chocobos? This time, it was Yuji who spoke up, capturing their attention. I mean, the farm owner said you could ride them, so, he explained. The others weren't entirely convinced because none of them had ridden one before. But a simple push from the demigoddess sealed the deal. What a brilliant idea! I'd always wanted to ride one of those adorable giant creatures. Rory exclaimed excitedly. Seeing that were no more possible options to take instead of that, the rest of the team gave mixed reactions. 
Some of them were even uncertain if it could work. Fine, as long as we get there in time, Brian said bluntly as he handed out the keys and instructed him to guard the vehicle before exiting in order to return to the farm and ask permission from the farm owner to borrow two or three chocobos. Al, who had worked as a mechanic at one point in his life, agreed without hesitation. He wasn't expecting to fix a military vehicle in the middle of a stable in another world. Luckily, each of the recon vehicles had their own respective toolboxes acting as a temporary solution to any breakdowns or little malfunctions. The rest soon followed his lieutenant's lead while the man had stayed behind. Even though they were unsure about riding these massive birds, it was the only way for them to get to the main village area right now. Man, I hope these birds are nice enough to give us a ride. It was the same phrase that was running through the men's heads. Riding massive birds like ostriches was not a common practice or tradition back in their homeworld. With the exception of a few individuals who were trained and destined to perform it on the odd ostrich racing event. Don't worry gentlemen, mark my words, you'll be enjoying this. Rory smiled. The young oracle kept reassuring the men that they will fully enjoy the experience rather than dislike it. It didn't take long enough that several of the chocobos were released from their respective cages in order for them to be strapped and prepared. Much to their surprise, the giant yellow birds eventually cooperated. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he yelled, taking off as fast as Usain Bolt, bumping his way through the crowd to save the befuddled and lost boy. His heart was racing because he was in a race against time, and fortunately, he was only a few steps away. As soon as he arrived at his destination, he grabbed and snatched the boy with all his strength from his current location before the out-of-control horse wagon could fully hit him. Furuta landed safely on the ground. Dirt almost went inside his eyes as he held the tight boy in his arms. The boy, on the other hand, was taken aback and perplexed. Wait a minute, what happened? The boy mumbled and wondered, unable to comprehend what had occurred. Prior to this, he caught sight of his mother on the other side of the plaza, who was also looking for him, and this gave him the motivation to keep running despite the growing stampede around him. The JSDF soldier exhaled a sigh of relief. Are you okay, kid? He asked the boy as he assisted him in getting back on his feet. The surprised and confused boy slowly nodded as a response. Then you should be careful the next time, or you might get hurt. Furuta wasted no time in imparting basic wisdom to the child, though he had a feeling there was a reason for the child's singular focus. He had just realized that the latter was not at all lost. Did you get lost? He, asked the youngster, followed by a brief moment of silence. I'm looking for my mama, the boy simply said, as he pointed towards the same direction and to reveal his worried mother still struggling to find him amongst the crowd. Furuta nodded in understanding and in turn, he gave a small smile. Don't worry, I'll take you to your mom, he assured the boy, taking charge as he picked him up from the ground and placed him on his back, thus giving him a piggyback ride throughout the sea of crowd. It was going to be a short but difficult struggle to make his way through the panicked crowds, but in an unexpected turn of events, a familiar voice rang through his ears, as did everyone else's. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the boy yelled out at the top of his lungs to get his mother's attention. My son! As soon as they finally reached their destination, Furuta had returned the boy to the ground after a brief piggyback ride, confident that he was safe, and had watched the boy finally reunite with his family. As a result, a smile formed on his lips. So this is how it feels like to save a life and help them find their way. He never expected to say such words. Even though it was just a little village boy, there was something rewarding about it. Exactly, when was the last time he did save a life? Hitoshi, as his own thoughts were entertaining him that a familiar voice called out his name. Are you alright? He turned to face Tomita, who was surprisingly carrying two children on his back. Twin siblings, to be exact, who were quiet but thoroughly enjoying the piggyback ride of their own. It seemed that the bigger man had the same encountered a similar ordeal. The chef turned JSDF soldier, blinked a couple of times as he would then come to realize it. Tomita, what happened man? He soon asked, noticing the man's awkward expression. His fellow recon team member cringed and let out a small sigh. Well I had to step down from my post for a while. He simply stated his case. And then, uh, I ended up in this situation. He continued saying, as it turned out, Furuta wasn't the only one who had to save someone from harm's way. Apparently, the big man himself had to rescue several children who were caught in the middle of the now-neutralized stampede. The twins were the last of them to be rescued by him. Then in the middle of that, the sounds of a vehicle engine were suddenly heard, followed by a familiar honk of a certain vehicle. Both men then turned to see one of the recon LAVs approaching them from behind. Hey guys! Sorry for the late arrival, but I think you might need assistance. The voice of Daisuke, one of the members of the third recon team announced. The back of the LAV was revealed to be empty, save for another recon member, Tetsuya Nishina, who was waving his hand to get the attention of the rest of them. He also had a spare megaphone in his hand as he spoke, bringing it to his lips. Attention everybody, may all women, children, and elderly, please proceed here. When he made that announcement, the children's eyes lit up with excitement at the prospect of being able to ride one of those moving metal carriages. The rest of the adults were relieved that their elderly would not have to endure any more hardship. Most of the villagers, who had wagons that didn't have enough space to accommodate more people, wasted no time in assisting their own elderly, women carrying a child, and then the children towards the empty back of the horseless carriages. Careful ma'am. Please watch your step. Don't get too excited kids. A sigh of relief came out from both men as they watched the situation unfold before their eyes. Truth to be told, it was definitely a lifesaver. Well I guess I'll take these twins back to their parents. Tomita spoke this time. See you later. He added before leaving the area. The man wanting to get things quickly done as possible in a good way. Yeah see you later. Furuta returned the smile deciding that since there was no more of any of these cases, he should return to his main task and continue assisting with the evacuation process. But not before peering into the village hall, where the source of the fire was finally being extinguished. He felt a sense of relief that the situation eventually went back to normal, though he still could feel a small hint of uncertainty growing. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Karada was not the ideal person to be able to lift people's spirits. In terms of reassuring people that everything would be fine, he had a pretty empty track record. He wasn't like his fellow otaku captain, who had the experience of calming someone down in a crisis. Although, he considered this moment as an opportunity for him to prove himself that he was a nice and friendly person, to begin with. Hey, I guess I haven't told you girls my name yet but, you can call me Karada, the young man said, awkwardly attempting to introduce himself in a more gentlemanlike manner. His introduction, however, was met with silence because the two girls were still lost in their own thoughts. The elf girl did, however, return with a nervous smile, while the other girl gave a deadpan expression. Damn it, Karada you failed again. His inner voice yelled at him, causing him to cringe. The otaku soldier pondered again what to do next. Since the girls were worried about something, why not ask regarding the issue they were worried about? He had heard them pleading with Shino about it prior. Maybe he could lend some of his assistance, and see what he could do. Okay, girls. I understand there are a lot of things going on right now, but please allow me to assist in any way I can. Karada stated before adding, So, what do you girls want me to do? This time, his words had reached both of their ears, especially Tuka, who had raised both of her eyebrows, sensing that this nice man in green might be able to help them at least escape and make their way to the village hall without being noticed. Please sir, I need to see my father. He's in the village hall recovering from his injuries. Tuka spoke right away and presented her pleas. A glimmer of hope filled her eyes along the way. I needed to make sure he is safe. The elf girl's statement caught Karada off guard, and before he could respond, the blue-haired mage had beaten him to it. I need to get back to my house, Lele stated before adding. I believe my teacher is already there, and I need to inform him of the current situation. She told her side of the story, not a hint of any emotion on her face. Uh, Karada trailed off, the stress rising inside of him. The man was at a loss for words at the moment. Sure, he was eager to assist, but after hearing their cries, he was put in an unexpectedly difficult position. I'm not sure if I could help with you that, since I'm really not in the position to. Oh, pretty please. Took a beg as she held her hands together, small tears forming in her eyes. Man, why does she have to be so damn cute? Karada could hear his inner voice screaming again. The otaku part in him just couldn't resist it. Regardless of how much he wanted to help, he still had his responsibilities to attend to. And of course, as a soldier, he had to be overly strict and firm, but in a nice way. I'm sorry girls, but I have to follow orders. Karada then said in a sad way, shutting down whatever hope that the elf girl has. Took about his head in dismay. She knew these people's intentions were to keep them safe from the trouble outside. But a part of her continued in telling that she needed to get her father out of the village hall. She wasn't sure why, but she felt compelled to. She took a glance at her blue-haired friend who was surprisingly calmer than she had expected as if she had a plan in mind. In the middle of that, the disciple of Cato flashed a small smile for the first time and spoke. Excuse me sir, but would you like to see a magic trick? She suggested. This raised the man's own curiosity, and he obliged. A magic trick? Are you some kind of mage or something? Unbeknownst to him, his own guess was surprisingly correct. Lele simply nodded though she was amused because she had not previously elaborated on her ability to use magic. The man in green, on the other hand, would be the first to notice at this time. Karada, on the other hand, had never seen the kind of magic that exists in this world nor any of his fellow recon members. He actually considered himself lucky now as he was about to witness this mage girl's capabilities. Although, there was one tiny problem that he did not expect. Lele took a deep breath and motioned for the man to lean in closer. She was a little disappointed in herself for not bringing her wooden staff with her, but fortunately, she can still cast a spell without it. She had to rely on her persuasion this time around. When the man got close enough, the blue-haired mage decided to start as she brought her hands near the man's eyes. She made a smooth flowing motion, then uttered a phrase that would strengthen the spell. The area fell silent for a moment. Karada suddenly felt this lightness all over his mind and body, as if his consciousness was drawn into a euphoria he couldn't explain. The feeling was really good, but unbeknownst to him, 
He was already in a trance as seen through the eyes of the two girls. Lele snapped his fingers as the JSDF soldier lost consciousness and quickly fell asleep on his chair. Thus the little magic show was over. Tuka widened her eyes in amusement. You really did cast a sleeping spell on him. She commented and added, Are you sure he's going to be okay? She expressed a little bit of worry. Lele gave a small grin. Don't worry, a squirt of cold water will do the trick later. She stood up from her seat and encouraged the elf girl to leave the small tent. Come on, there isn't much time to waste. She stated. All right then. Tuka nodded as she followed. At the same time, the small tent was now occupied by a few villagers who were still recovering from the small commotion that had occurred earlier. Mari, Higashi, and Shino were forced to unload and rearrange a few beds, unaware that the two girls had finally left the small tent. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Elena immediately recognized the young lady and quickly rushed towards her. The young servant lady was unable to speak properly, her whole body trembling, and her eyes showed signs of trauma. All she could do was place her face on the elderly lady's shoulder. It's all right. Everything is all right, dear, Elena said as she comforted her. I apologize, miss, for the immediate question, but what happened here? Hodder asked, wanting to get to the bottom of this. The servant girl, Aura, tried her hardest to regain her composure. She started moving her lips. I it was Sir Marcus, he did it. She finally said it, revealing the identity of the perpetrator. I was the last to pack up, and just as I was about to leave, he appeared out of nowhere and began casting powerful magic with some kind of iron weapon. She continued to explain. No, that's impossible. That young man wouldn't have caused all of this. Elena had blurted out. Disbelief filled her eyes. How could the kind and sweet village official would such a thing? He was a person of honor, and he saved Kota Village from its recent struggles. Another wave of confusion enveloped Hodder, particularly wondering about this Marcus character, to begin with. Though his other thoughts would soon take over him as he brought his eyes towards the large doors leading outside. I think it would be best if you two should head outside, the elf man said catching their attention. What about my husband? The still worried Elena asked. Don't worry, I'll handle it. Hodder reassured her by placing both hands on her shoulder and smiling. Please go and alert everyone. The old lady's eyes glowed with apprehension. She was worried about her husband's safety, and now she was concerned about this man's life. But as much as she wanted to disagree, she chose to give her complete trust and responded with a simple nod. All right, but please be careful, she replied. I will. The man gave his promise as he left the two women and headed upstairs to confront the assailant. No matter how much danger he is in, he will not succumb to fear so easily. X X X X X X X X X X X X X X. It moved like a spirit as it bears witness to a dangerous confrontation. The small entity did its best as it hid its own presence from the two men. It had been closely monitoring the situation, especially the secret activities of the so-called village official. Despite the potential risk that it presents, it had to follow the instructions given by its master. Oh, how difficult it was to precisely follow her orders, despite the fact that her ever-kind character and caring presence often made it completely trust her. Now, all it had to do was to anticipate what could happen next. The small entity felt this nervousness creeping up. It hoped that its master and her friends would arrive as soon as possible before things get out of hand. X X X X X X X X X X X X X. It's a great honor to finally meet you, Sage Kato. He allowed his voice to be heard all throughout the room. He saw no reason to pretend anymore. The man was well aware that the old mage would not go down that easily. Even at that age, he was regarded as a threat. His failing mind had persuaded him to test the weapon at the entrance, only to be greeted by his unexpected earlier arrival. A devious smile crept upon his lips. It was his own way of greeting a respectable figure, and to see if he was really him. This was the first time he had seen the old man display what he could do. Kato had never seen such strong magic unleashed from a small iron before. The insignia that manifested in front of the barrel strongly resembled a type of fire magic. He felt drained a little bit as a result of his staff absorbing the shock that followed after. The now circular damaged portion of the door had small bits of fire surrounding the outline, and luckily it did not grow or spread. He immediately brushed that off as his attention solely focused on the current matter at hand. The village official tightened his grip on his weapon as he pointed it directly at a trembling Eldar. What's the meaning of this Marcus? Cato demanded. Have you lost your mind? Following that, he was greeted by silence, sensing the younger man's strange calmness. Marcus, on the other hand, kept smiling. He had the upper hand, and now was the time to strike up a harmless conversation with the old mage. He wanted to ask so many personal questions, but he had to follow the rules. The man sighed as he sat in a nearby wooden chair, placing the iron barrel on the table alongside the open scroll to demonstrate that he wasn't intending to harm the old man. Please understand, I have no bad intentions. He further elaborated. I just wanted to talk to you. Kato narrowed his eyes, refusing to let down his guard, 
despite the fact that the younger man appeared to want to tell him his true reasons and motivation for doing this. He was also aware of the man's history, but he has yet to discover his true identity and intentions. Tell me, Marcus, what does this village have to do with Sad Era? He took a deep breath and asked. Marcus simply smirked. I believe there is a misconception about your statement. He then said, This village has nothing to do with the Empire. He went on to say, I'm merely just here to prevent its fate. The bitterness in his eyes was visible as he looked down. As I was given this second chance, I wanted to share with the people here. He said, casting a quick glance at the village chief before returning his gaze to the old sage, beaten and left to die in the wilderness by his own countrymen. This village saved my life and gave me the realization that people like you are the true heroes and the ones that have the purest hearts. Marcus said, remembered all the wonderful things that this place had done for him. The kindness of this place is unmatched in my eyes. He added, so I did my best to repay you all as much as I can. There were small tears visibly falling from his eyes. The droughts, natural disasters, and struggles that this settlement had endured. He was there to share the experience with the people of Kota village. Fortunately, he still had his closest trusted comrades back home who generously pledged their support, and the village came back to life. Not long after, he regained a chance to return to his home once more, if only he would accept what they had proposed. He was afraid and that the time would soon come for this place to be erased from existence. This is the only way for Kota village to survive but to ensure its survival. He then fixed his gaze on the sage. You must accept certain conditions. He went on to say. Silence befell the whole room. Cato was clearly not pleased with this proposal from the start. It sounded more like a ruse than a genuine offer. There is a growing movement in the capital to pursue an opportunity for change and innovation. Marcus explained. Though the emperor and majority of the senate isn't all aware yet, we want you to be a part of this change since. Since. I'm the only one that could convince them to join. Cato finished the rest of the sentence for the man. Marcus simply nodded. Correct. Rondell is one fine city and a without its vast knowledge. The kingdoms in this continent wouldn't be able to gain that much knowledge if it weren't for their contributions. But still they cannot withstand the power of the northern civilizations. Marcus continued, arguing how its potential was wasted due to its own principles. Cato sighed, the same questions had arrived to haunt him again. Rondell has pledged that it will never involve itself with any of the Empire's activities nor any of the remaining kingdoms in this land. The old mage fired back. Marcus gave a rare chuckle. Times are changing old man, he said. You're too confident that your home will be safe for years to come. But I tell you, its days are numbered. Is that threat? Cato raised an eyebrow and asked. The village official chuckled again. A grave warning, if you don't take this last opportunity. He explained as he grabbed the iron barrel once more. The old mage tightened his grip on the staff, sensing a possible act of violence. You see, I will finally reclaim the power that I once held as a member of the nobility. He went on to say, and through that power, this village will gain a new home where it will be safe from the dangers of this world. The man then extended his hand, and a new reason for future generations to live a fruitful life. Marcus, the men in green had provided us. Don't be a fool, Eldar, he exclaimed. What makes you so trusting of strangers you've just met? He stated. They could be spies from our enemies sent to entice you into their own twisted ways of slavery. Your minds had been clouded by their tools of deception and persuasion, he added, as his thoughts turned to a specific person. There's no doubt why that useless apostle of Emra had sided with them. Eldar could only grit his teeth in frustration and then look down in defeat. You don't understand, he muttered to himself. Cato noticed as he stood firm. And as Marcus looked at the old mage for one more time, he presented his so-called offer. I beg you great sage, for the goodness and safety of this village, and as well as the future of this land, join us. You don't want your precious loved one to die in vain as a result of your decision. Silence had befallen the room once more. No matter how deceiving or convincing that this man is, he would still choose to honor the principles of his forgotten ancestors. Cato took a deep breath as he narrowed his eyes on the village official. I'm sorry but I'm going to refuse your offer, he said. Rondell and Cota village is better off without the empire. 
He finished his statement, while his anticipation grew. No matter what happens, we'll survive and create a future of our own. Marcus's face was stricken with disappointment. His rage grew stronger as he realized he had no other choice but to act. So be it. The man uttered as he pointed his weapon towards Eldar, who widened his eyes in shock. With a possible act of murder on the horizon, Cato forced himself to act quickly to prevent any deaths from happening, but he found himself being trailed off by time. Marcus was about to pull the trigger when something sharp passed by and directly hit his hand, forcing him to fire elsewhere and drop the weapon. Yet another small explosion erupted in the room, damaging the walls instantly. The man felt extreme pain in his hand as he looked down to see the kind of object that hit him, and to his surprise, the object was revealed to be a butter knife of some sort that penetrated to his skin, wounding it in the process. A surprised Cato turned his attention to the mysterious person that had unexpectedly thrown the knife. His eyes widened as he immediately recognized him and mentioned his name. Hodder! What are you? Damn you! You'll pay for what you've done! Marcus interrupted again as he recovered and pointed the weapon at the two. But he was too late because the old mage immediately countered by casting a spell that sent a small shockwave towards the man. Though unbeknownst to him, a portion of his blood from the wound had dropped on the scroll itself, thus causing the symbol to glow and react. It didn't take long for Marcus to be thrown against the wall, rendering him unconscious. As a result, the two were given more time to finally rescue the weakened village chief, who found himself falling to the ground. Despite the pain in his leg, Hodder wasted no time in rushing to retrieve the old chief. When he arrived, he quickly grabbed the chief and carried him all the way back to the door through his back. Cato, still taken aback, wondered how the elf man had discovered them. The last time he saw him, the Koan village protector was laying on his bed, barely able to eat his own food. As for Hodder, he exactly knew what was going to happen next. He wasn't that too late to eavesdrop on the whole conversation, merely hiding just behind the doors, and when things were on the way to get out of hand. Like any informal negotiations, he decided to take action. He was fortunate enough to stumble upon a small butter knife on the ground on his way towards the room, as if someone had just placed it there for him to acquire it. Explanations are best saved for later Cato. He told the old mage as beckoned the old man to follow him in an effort to finally leave the place. Cato nodded in agreement, but his worry rose up again as he took notice of the scroll on the table the symbol on it which began to glow in red. His eyes widened in shock. Explosion magic, he thought to himself, wondering how Marcus had acquired such forbidden magic. You'll pay for what you have done, the village official exclaimed in anger once more as he tried to recover on his own. You will all regret this. Let's go, Hodder exclaimed once more as he encouraged the old mage to go with him. Desperation was slowly creeping up to him. Before the old mage could turn around, he gave the man one last pitiful look. A part of him wished to save the latter, but the scroll's power was now generating large amounts of energy, slowly engulfing the room and rendering him unable to take another action and save the man. I'm sorry, Marcus, Cato muttered as he finally left the room with the wood elf. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
As he said his final words, the red spark and energy engulfed him, followed by a blinding light and a menacing voice erupted. You'll be our vessel. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the door suddenly burst open to reveal Kato, and a blonde man that they had never seen before and who was actually carrying a weakened Eldar on his back. Get out of here as soon as you can. The village hall is about to blow up. The blonde man yelled as he warned the three recon members. There was visible confusion on their faces for a few moments before they realized what was really going to happen next. Tomida! Furuta! The old sergeant exclaimed as he pushed the younger men to flee as fast as they can. Questions were going around their minds as to what had transpired inside. But before they can attempt to fully comprehend the situation, their thoughts were suddenly interrupted as a wave of dark red energy erupted from the village hall followed by a loud explosion. Boom! The shockwave was powerful in that it toppled a lot of the market stalls designed to carry heavy loads of supplies. The windows of nearby houses instantly broke into pieces, followed by strong winds that swept across the village plaza. It felt as if a bomb explosion and a tornado banded together to wreak havoc on a certain place. Fortunately, Cato was able to cast a spell that created a force field that briefly shielded the others, who were all on the verge of losing their balance and being sent away to a greater distance. As a result, most of them just fell to the ground, facing the dry gravel and dirt. The situation quickly calmed down as silence returned in a matter of minutes. Unbeknownst to them, their world was slowly changing. Is everybody all right? Sergeant Kuwahara immediately asked. We're all right, sir. But what the heck was that? The others took time to recover. Hotter who quickly assisted the village chief yet again, was about to speak when he was suddenly interrupted by a deafening roar. All of their attention immediately shifted towards the now destroyed village hall as a dark red essence filled the place and a thick fog which began to cover the entire village premises. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
But the situation outside is finally stable, right? The man asked, receiving a nod from the young woman. Well, according to Daisuki, the evacuation is near completion but there was a bit of problem, Mari explained. Higashi flashed a confused expression. What's the issue now? He asked again. Mari only gave him a serious look. The atmosphere inside the medical tent slowly began to change without their knowledge. The wind grew stronger as if an overwhelming presence was fast approaching them. And at that moment, the world around them changed abruptly as the powerful shockwave reached the area, causing the wind's power to accelerate to higher levels, blowing everything away. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Seriousness filled her eyes for the first time as she called in command for the giant yellow birds to take off again, and all of them did so at the same time, startling the rest of the recon members. Can someone please tell me what's happening? Carl exclaimed once more, holding into his older brother soldier, even as to squeezing it due to the anxiety that was fueled yet again. Damn it, Carl. Please calm down, will ya? Lieutenant Brian exclaimed, almost losing his balance and control. As a matter of fact, the rest of the men were now attempting to calm the giant yellow birds down, to which they miserably failed. The Chocobos, on the other hand, knew what they were doing. Concentrate people. You might not want to get crushed by them. Rory replied back referring to an incoming threat, yet brought in more questions rather than answers. Them? Who's them? Another question rang out. Soon, the giant roots of the trees began to move and rise like tentacles of an attacking octopus, and that automatically answered all their questions in mind. The men's eyes quickly widened in shock to find that the trees were now moving wild and erratically, and it was from the stuff of nightmares. Not long after the roots themselves began acting violently as many of them began to smash the ground hard. Luckily, the Chocobo birds were able to avoid them, barely. Shit. This isn't what I'm expecting. Yet another comment was made, this time from Itami. Screw this. We're not going to be smashed by these giant tree tentacles. And more surprisingly, Lieutenant Brian exclaimed, describing the giant wild moving roots in his own vocabulary, and much more determined to get out of this mess. Yuji found himself in the middle of a strange nightmare. His mind couldn't comprehend what was transpiring around him. This wasn't normal anymore by Earth's standards, as if he had just entered the wild imagination of a troubled person. One small mistake equals the death of them all. He couldn't help himself but only hoped to escape this unexpected situation in one piece. Although, for the demigoddess herself, the excitement continued to fill her mind. The dark presence brought forward by the shockwave was very much familiar, and it has been a while since she had confronted them. A small confident smile formed around her lips as she uttered, I couldn't wait to get there. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Cato thought to himself, as he secretly prayed to the gods for strength. He wasn't sure if he could still withstand a presence, as the urban legend predicted. His mind was a mess as he tried to figure out how Marcus obtained the exact scroll that served as a vessel for centuries-old evil. Soon after the roar, there was a burst of maniacal laughter that followed, and three massive shadows emerged from behind the thick fog that had engulfed the ruins, followed by a deep, intimidating voice. How long has it been? Cato could feel his heartbeat at a faster rate. He gripped his staff tightly as he can despite the tension in the air that produced more fear. He had to keep his eyes locked in a specific direction. He recalled to his childhood, particularly his own grandmother's words as she retold the certain story many times to him. An urban legend that used to frighten many children. Whenever they are near you, the ground began to shake as one of the huge shadows had finally sensed something. Don't make a single noise. A menacing smile crept upon its face as it laid its eyes in a certain direction. If they hear you, they will hunt you. In the middle of the thick fog, the huge shadow took off in blinding speed. And amongst all that, don't breath. Cato opened his eyes to face the huge shadow finally charging towards him. He had very limited time and soon began chanting a spell as quickly as he can to prevent it from reaching him. As the menacing entity finally closed in, the fog that surrounded it began to fade away, revealing a demonic wolf-like face with malicious blood-red eyes that seemed to be blocked by some kind of white mist and an evil glass glow grin. Sensing that a presence was now nearby, the entity bothered to finish its words as it raised its gigantic claws to strike him. The taste of fear is sweet. Chapter End And well, that's a wrap for this chapter, and I cannot believe that I've been writing 10,000 word chapters for like weeks already. And to be honest, it's freaking exhausting mentally. I guess this is what Defamar CV felt like when he wrote the chapters for Freedom's Ring and the fight we chose. He had to really push himself to finish an arc in the story despite the procrastination and other setbacks. Plus, I'm really amazed at how he was able to follow the vision for his story and the ambition for it. All I could say was pretty big, and that is really inspiring. I wonder when will I reach the 30,000 word mark? So let's talk about the chapter for a bit. As usual, the scenes are close and personal, very much in the perspective of most of the characters. Some scenes were also cut. I did my best to present the idea of a sense of urgency and a creeping danger in the atmosphere, and at the same time, that the rest of the main characters were now figuring it out. A race against time perhaps? The scene where Lele puts Karada into sleep via magical hypnotism is loosely based on those mini-adventure escape scenes involving teens or kids that you see in the movies. Kuwahara crowd controlling the villagers into calmness via megaphone is something from the Army of Darkness movie. This is my boomstick scene particularly but in a less intense way. And as for the scene involving the moving gigantic trees, I'm not sure yet. And for the three big bad enemies... I did have a background for them, and I'm still planning on how to reveal them in a more interesting way. All I can say so far is that these three demonic beasts and their actions are a combination of urban legend and the elements from the movies. Don't breath in a quiet place. I hope that makes sense. Furthermore, the next chapter is going to be much more challenging since it would have a bit of a survival action horror element. With that said, I guess this is the last of my thoughts regarding the chapter. I apologize for any grammar slash spelling mistakes since English is not my main language and also please go easy on me since I'm not a member of any military organizations. Thank you also for your support and time for reading the story, that means so much and I really appreciate it. 17. Intermission Chapter, A Duke's Memoirs Disclaimer, I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Lands of Rodinius Intermission Chapter Everyone has their own nightmares. Fortunately, the darkest horrors are always locked up inside the human mind. Never had the chance to be freed and manifest into reality. The curse that had been dormant in this region had now awakened. Every time I pass by this land, I always feel this pitifulness for the folks, who are still oblivious of its tragic past. The evil arose from the injustice and murders of the innocent men, resulting in the ruin of countless settlements, and even claimed its latest victims, and the nightmare persisted for hundreds of years. May the souls of the departed and involved in this senseless slaughter be at rest. 
May the gods have mercy and give blessings to the people who would stumble and settle upon this land, for they do not know what they are doing, from the memoirs of a merchant. And thank you for giving time to read the small intermission chapter, Smiley Face. 18. Arc 1, Code of Village Part 5. Disclaimer. I don't own Gate or Nihonka Shokan as it belongs to its rightful owners. Arc 1, Lands of Rodinius. Code of Village Part 5. A Dark Past. The sun did not fully emerge that day, as if it were shrouded in shame. Only a few of its rays penetrated through the depressing gray clouds, giving light to a certain event being held at a town plaza. The crowd had finally grown into a huge size as the anticipation soared through an all-time high. The majority of the townsfolk roared in rage at a handful of silent men, who were being led into their fates. Murderers. Savages. You all deserve to be punished. The spiteful screams of them echoed through their ears. As much as they wanted to ignore the countless curses and vulgarisms thrown at them, they still could feel the agony, sorrow, and betrayal inside them. Yes, everyone knew the atrocities secretly done to the women and children by these barbaric soldiers that took over their land and seeing no hope of salvation. Justice had to be done in their own way. Who would have guessed that these townspeople were the same individuals who considered and treated them as members of the family and community? The men can't even put into words how they felt as they approached their last destination. They had not expected that their own situation would go down this, but would eventually come to accept it. In the middle of the plaza stood three huge wooden stakes and a big stack of hay surrounding them. It wasn't long before the troops guarding them brought the men to their respective locations and they were instantly bound by a thick, strong rope from their chests to their bellies. The only pitiful thing that the three men had noticed was that the soldiers were actually their closest friends, who were forced to put on these armors and outfits, in hopes of hiding their guilt and shame, as the noise from the crowd grew larger, signaled the beginning of their sentence. Through the eyes of one of these men, a devoted husband and parent felt his heart race. He wasn't ready to meet the god of the underworld just yet. As he yearned to see his family again, tears streamed down his cheeks. He wished to live. He won't be able to see his children grow up, nor have the chance to protect them. Let this man be damned and suffer the worst fate than death. He heard the yells of the high priest as the crowd cheered with him. The once sorrow and agony had now been replaced with rage and vengeance. How could a priest like him be spared and able to spread his dirty doings? He molested children and defiled countless poor young souls. He was the one that joined the fray of these outsiders, and now he had deceived all of them, turned them as corrupt as himself. They should be the ones that be damned. They will surely pay for what they have done. Not a moment too soon, the torch was lit and the fire was finally raised. However, it wasn't any ordinary fire. The dark fiery essence had been cast and quickly spread throughout the haystack until reached his body and slowly engulfed him. Besides the insults, he could hear the numerous laughter of the traitors, especially the corrupt ones, who were able to get away from their wrongdoings. The rage finally had taken over his mind, and before the dark fire can fully bring him to the other world, he was able to move his lips and announced his final words. Curse you all! I swear to the deep recesses of my soul, you will suffer the same fate as we suffered on this day. He yelled out to the top of his lungs, igniting a demonic presence that arose from the area, oblivious to the townsfolk themselves. It was the day they had sealed their fates. As he felt his life draining away, he peered intently at the people observing him, especially those who had wrecked his entire life, family, and chance to live in peace. And with that stated, the guy had let out the last of his words. Damned you all to hell. You people will never leave this land even until the day of your deaths. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
but he had no options to choose from. The Californian wiped the sweat on his forehead as he grabbed another wrench and plier to properly disassemble some of the parts. He was fortunate enough that he was able to move himself and the vehicle to a different spot due to some simple but annoying circumstances. Prior to this, he definitely had a rough time trying to examine the problem at hand, as the area where he was previously in was nothing but gravel and soil. The weather became much windier and as a result, his very own eyes became the victim of the dust that went along with the wind. It was very irritating and he let out a couple of swears and cusses right after that. Fortunately, he was able to get out of that situation and move to a more secure and grassy area. If it hadn't been for the farmer's assistance in giving a couple of his chocobos, who were in charge of assisting him in moving the LAV to the current location. Man, these birds are damn strong. So he had thought in his mind, first time seeing two giant yellow birds pull the much heavier military vehicle, and it took only about four to five minutes to move it. As much as he had so many questions in his mind, he eventually placed those aside and started working on the LAV once more. Almost an hour had already passed, and he was starting to feel the soreness on his back. He was under LAV, laying on the grass as he faced another set of intricate wires and parts to check. His lips were already dry, as he still hadn't drunk a small portion of water or even a sip of it to quench his growing thirst. He was successful in fixating on the task at hand that he was already forgetting his own well-being. Seconds passed, the sweat was all over his body, and a part of him was now expressing a desire to take a short break. His mind was already at conflict, stuck between choosing to rest or continue the repairs all the way. However, due to his own struggles, fate had to intervene and decide the outcome. Young man, at that moment, a voice called out to him. Al felt startled as he almost jolted up, nearly hitting colliding his head with the metal. He quickly took a glance and caught a glimpse of a pair of brown boots standing in front, and eventually decided to slide back outside to meet the ladder. The person turned out to be the old farmer himself, who along brought a couple of jugs made of brown leather containing water inside. You haven't had a single drink, and you look dry as the desert young man he said, speaking in some form of countryside accent back in the home as he offered a single jug towards him. The surprised Californian soldier flashed a smile in return. Oh, thank you, sir, he said, accepting the jug and immediately went to drink as the clean liquid washed through his dry lips and finally quenched his thirst. Furthermore, the water was very tasty, not the kind of water he had tasted before in the many plastic bottles back home. No worries, the farmer replied. It would be my shame if I did not return back the kindness that you and your people provided. He explained as a thought came to him. Tell me, why were all of your friends seemed in a hurry? The old farmer asked, raising an eyebrow. Al finished his drink and wiped off the remaining sweat on his forehead. His mind was put back into work once more, thinking of a simple explanation regarding the situation. The information might come as a sensitive topic though he needed to let the farmer know of what has currently transpired. Um, there was a bit of a commotion in the main plaza. A part of the village hall was on fire, and the villagers were also panicking at the same time, he explained. The old farmer nodded in understanding. I see, that's why they were so eager to borrow a few of the chocobos, he said, turning his eyes towards the metallic fort. And one of your horseless carriages, has it lost its magic entirely? His curiosity has begun to peak. Never he had seen this type of strange but unique transportation. Though he had heard that there were similar inventions in the other lands across the Great Orient. The Chocobos would slowly lose their importance as a convenient mode of transportation if these kinds of unique moving forts would be introduced to the continent. Um, it's not really powered by magic, sir, Al replied, giving the farmer a surprise of his time, though he had his own struggles of explaining it. He didn't pay that much attention to his science class. As he was about to speak, the old farmer raised up his hand. You don't have to explain, young man. I now understand what you mean. He gave a tiny chuckle. Oh, but I must say, you and your friends are one of the bravest people I have ever met. The old farmer added. Being able to venture those forests and also step foot in that village. The wind grew stronger as he spoke these words. A sense of anxiety had emerged in the air. This confused the American soldier. What do you mean, sir? 
The farmer's eyes were suddenly filled with worry. Haven't they told you about this region, where Kota Village had settled not long ago? The younger man shook his head. No, sir. The farmer exhaled a sigh. Oh, I see. He reasoned that at the very least, this man should be aware of the dangers that awaited them if they entered a portion of a lost evil's domain. There was a sense of dread that Al had felt. He was now curious and eager to learn more about this place. Sorry, sir, but can I ask, what kind of place is this exactly? He asked. The younger man did not even bother to learn more regarding the history of this land when he first arrived here. He was still a skeptic. There was an immediate hush in the air. The elderly farmer walked over to a nearby cut-down tree trunk and took a seat. Well, young man, there is a reason why I settled my farm here in this area, he explained. To my knowledge, once you settled inside that certain grounds covering the forest and the village, you might experience the horrors of the past and the pain that this land has endured, he explained. Al's knowledge had gradually dawned on him. The Californian soldier's eyes widened in amazement. The man told the story in such a way that it seemed like an urban legend. You mean this place is cursed, sir? The man spoke flatly, expressing the only rational conclusion that came to him. He'd read enough bizarre and otherworldly stories to come up with an explanation for his comment. The old farmer gave this pitiful expression. There was this relief within him that he had treasured. He considered himself lucky enough to not be able to stay there for a long time, and he was pleased that the young man in green was able to figure it out quickly. He chuckled quietly. It's up to you to decide if this is true, or merely hearsay. As he turned his gaze to the dark woodland, the farmer murmured. Because of what my forefathers observed, they passed down this story from generation to generation as a warning. He elaborated. So meaning that this village is the only victim of this curse? Al asked. He was now starting to guess. No young man. It's not just this village. The farmer replied while a small confusion filled the younger man's eyes. I'm afraid to tell you that this settlement is just one of its latest victims. He then took a deep breath as he began to tell the story he was familiar with since his younger days. Do you truly believe Kota Village is the only village that has ever existed on this land? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
The highlight of it all was this unique invention's ability to produce cold air that kept a very relaxing and cool atmosphere inside. Certainly, no one has ever done this before, at least not from their point of view. The only explanation they could come up with was that these men in green had discovered a method to harness cold-based magic and merge it with this horseless carriage. Therefore the coldness that surrounded them inside this moving fort. In truth, it was just a built-in mini air conditioner. Oh, my apologies young man, we were just wondering the kind of magic does this horseless carriage had, it's amazing. The old lady smiled, wanting to share her own thoughts with the man in green. But to answer your question, we are fine as of the moment. Daisuke sighed in relief. Looking at the two women, brought some sense of peace to the man. It kind of reminded him of his mother and sister, they were always calmest no matter what situation they were in. Is there something the matter sir? A question was then followed up by the young servant girl. A small portion of sweat began to pour down from Daisuke's forehead, though he kept his own calm facade. Everything is going okay so far, I just want to check if things are fine with you all, he explained. Both of the women simply nodded. Daisuke smiled in return as he went back to focus on the road. Much to his disappointment, the surroundings were still covered by the thickness of the fog. He took a deep breath once more as he adjusted the brakes and continued on with the journey. Unbeknownst to him, the last and remaining piece of a certain shockwave had arrived in the area. And as he was about to step on the pedal once more, the light armored vehicle suddenly died down. There was a small tremble from the ground that everyone had felt afterward. They were all startled to their hearts as they began to look around in worry. What the heck was that? Daisuke asked himself, trying to comprehend if a small earthquake did occur. The two women were also brought back from their own thoughts as they were greeted by this sense of urgency. Both women held each other's hands in slight fear. On the other hand, Daisuke felt urged to investigate what was happening outside. He could feel this unexplainable feeling of heat as if he was placed inside an oven. As if he was about to turn to his left side, which was the driver's window, there was a small knocking on it, and by the time he turned towards it, an image of a pale village boy with huge fresh scratched wounds on his forehead had greeted him. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
silence befell the area afterward. In that small moment, Hodder's mind and thoughts immediately to his old friend. He needed to gather a lot of confidence and strength, as he knew that the latter won't survive that kind of onslaught. He expressed his own disappointment towards himself for not believing the legend. It was in fact only a wives' tale back in his home, as a means to warn anybody who would venture towards the cursed land. Now that it has been released to reality once more, there was only one possible way to combat it. The thought had been hanging around in Hodder's head for a while now, ever since he had finally accepted a certain widespread assumption. The elf man stood up and left towards a specific location. He closed the shed's door and quickly cast a spell of illusion and a small protection barrier that surrounded it. This will prolong the old man's safety until the situation has finally been dealt with. With one goal in mind, he was determined to recreate an only known weakness. He hoped that he wasn't too late, though he still had complete trust that the old mage would give him more time. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
or at least had the intelligence to act. Based on what he had heard from the elders' tales and written accounts, these beasts were supposed to be wild as a feral wolves. The strangest thing was that he could sense a hint of humanity in them. Heh, how ironic that there is some kind of magical barrier that is still imprisoning us here. The old man's eyes slowly filled with worry. While the three beasts continued their own discussion, he proceeded to take a few steps back in hopes of getting farther away from them. We may not able to see it now, but I can sense that someone is just nearby and responsible for it. The beast arrogantly smirked. There was a reason why he referred to only one individual. Even a single archmage cannot be sustained and keep the barrier this long, let alone that it would take a toll on one's mana energy. Now then, don't pretend to be brave, we could smell your fear no matter what. The third beast chuckled as it instinctively tried to approach the old sage nearby. You think you could protect yourself that long? Whoever you are. As much as Kato was tempted to speak up, he still remained silent. However, the beast spoke the truth as he could feel his mana slowly fading away. This kind of protection magic had consequences. With one being able to cast this certain spell was already a feat. It would take more than one individual to fully stabilize the barrier. At that point, the elderly mage raised his hand, signaling the men in green to remain where they were. He was well aware that they were already enticed to engage in combat with their unearthly black artifact-like weapons. Disappointment with himself rushed through him. He should have alerted them about these demons, their skills, and their supposed limitations earlier. So what are we going to do next? The same question ran through the minds of the younger Recon members. Hitoshi felt the cold sweat drip down towards his neck as he and his comrade faced a possible violent confrontation with these mysterious beings. Both of their minds were overwhelmed by facing the unknown. Sure, there was a briefing where they were informed of the known creatures that they would have encountered during their reconnaissance. And in their first grasp of meeting a creature of this world, they were introduced to something different than they have seen before. The young man took a quick glance at the bruiser, who pretty much had the same tense and concentrated face as him. The big man had been in that position as if he were a statue. Believe it or not, Hitoshi even managed to let out a very faint smile in these times of danger. His thoughts then eventually went to a certain otaku soldier, and his knowledge of many fantastical creatures from the genre he was obsessed about. I wish I could have listened to his advice once. He couldn't believe he was saying that to himself. He was a chef and then soldier, but not someone who would know all this information that often resided in the world of fiction. Turns out, the otaku soldier was right all along. Dragons, fairies, and possibly demons. He felt goosebumps all over his body. The kind of scenario of being killed by something not human is quite possible now. He was afraid, and he feared for his life for the first time. It wasn't that long when his thoughts were surprisingly interrupted, as the young man suddenly heard a faint voice that whispered to his ears. To the left, the mysterious voice had said, prompting Hitoshi to interpret this as some kind of warning. It referred to a certain spot near the old mage, a ground suddenly bursting as if something was emerging from deep down. He did look to the left, and saw the small scene itself. Hitoshi. Tomita called his name this time, through a whisper. The look on the man's eyes show anticipation and a hint of nervousness, which the young JSDF soldier quickly understood. What was going to happen next? A wide grin crept across the main beast's face. To think that no one cooperated with his demands, that he had decided to finally take matters into his own hands. He brought his claws to his wrist and gave a strong scratch enough for his own blood to drip towards the ground. Once the blood made contact on the ground, he immediately kneeled down and punched the small pool of blood. As a result, the small portion of blood began to move like a stream as it passed through the magical barrier. It didn't take too long for it to boil and react creating a small earthquake in its area, and moments passed, the once peaceful soil and gravel erupted, as something had finally emerged from under. It started with blood, followed by a mass of flesh and bones, a hint of smoke as the anomaly began to grow and take shape in the form of a creature. The disgust that Sergeant Kuwahara felt was extreme. He almost felt throwing up. The sight of seeing an abomination being formed in front of him. It was even gorier and gruesome than what Junjo Ito or the body horror movies in his world could portray. 
Kato remained strict and firm. He exactly knew what the beast was trying to do. The only thing that bothered him was that if he could still handle the surprises thrown into him. He didn't have the physical strength to wrestle the beast. His only ally was his own magic which was slowly dwindling. Furthermore, his attention was everywhere as tried his best to search even the smallest suspicious movements. That became the starting point of his fall. He only had one thought in mind, as a second solution if things didn't go down as planned. It didn't take too long, for the anomaly had finally completed its form and as the last of the faint smoke had faded away. A huge black demonic wolf-like beast now stood in its position, with the same menacing blood-red eyes. It saw the old man and began to form a familiar glass glow grin. Not too long, the beast took off at a blinding speed, eyeing the mage as its target and prey. At the same time, one of the main beasts decided to join in as he charged at the barrier once more, knowing that this would be an advantage for him to finally break the temporary imprisonment. Kato quickly found himself in a dire situation. A possibility of a two-front attack and damage came into his mind, and he had to act swiftly or else face death. As the world slowed down around him, the old man scrambled as he began to utter a phrase to cast another spell. But before he could do that, the claws of the newly summoned beast had suddenly reached near his face. But at the same time, there was a loud sharp noise that rocked the area. Not long after, he caught glimpse of a strange small golden metallic arrow pass by and hit the charging beast directly on the head. It wasn't alone as more of these small metallic arrows followed after, hitting his attacker on the face and the chest. The summoned beast crashed to the ground, growling in anguish. Blood splattered on the ground as the wolf demon sought to comprehend what had just occurred. There was no reason that these humans could produce such a surprisingly strong range of magic. Now more alert, they attempted to search for the source. What? Impossible. Who could have? The leader of the demons began to wonder, not knowing that a certain JSDF sergeant was the one responsible for the interruption. Furthermore, it gave Kato the time to focus on his other attacker which was one of the main beasts, who had finally reached him. Fortunately, the old mage was able to brace himself as the huge beast collided with the barrier using his own freakish strength, thereby finally breaking the temporary prison. Unknown to the mage certain damage has finally been inflicted on him. Due to the force of the tackle, the old sage acted quickly, using his wind magic to land himself securely. However, the adversary was still on the prowl. You won't get away that easily. You are mine, the beast growled as it made another attempt to launch at him. By that time, several loud and sharp shots rang out, and this time it came from one of the two-story buildings nearby. The enemy found itself being hit by the same metallic objects, and the strong force that it produced, resulted in it being sent into the ground once more. You are reckless, one scolded him, and the other just laughed at his own brother. Meanwhile, Kato had slowly recovered with the help of the JSDF sergeant, who was responsible for incapacitating the first enemy. Mr. Kato, we need to get out this place as fast as we can, Sergeant Kuwahara exclaimed again. While the mage was about to speak, he suddenly felt pain in his stomach. Much to Sergeant Kuwahara's confidence, he caught a glimpse of their attackers, who had suddenly recovered, in the blink of an eye and now wanted vengeance. This is not good. He gritted him as he immediately thought regarding their dire situation. This was the point at which he had finally chosen to radio Tomita and Hitoshi to fire again at the enemy. But something unexpected had transpired before he could do so. He heard the old man cry out an incantation that he didn't understand. And seconds later, he found himself encircled by this circular red symbol on the ground. And in one blink of an eye, he was consumed by a blinding flash of an eye. And just like that, the old mage and the Japanese sergeant were nowhere to be found in the area. Damn it! Frustration caused the beast to curse. The old man was very clever with his magic tricks. A scapegoat move that a lot of his kind would do whenever they are close to being killed. The magical barrier that held them inside was now gone. As a result, they could now sense all the different human presence lingering around the premises. A reward that they had not been expecting. So it seems, they are not the only ones present here, the leader of the three had said, his smile widening in delight as he realized that there was more prey hiding in plain sight. Furthermore, 
the cursed mage and the strange man in green were not that far from here. Despite the temporary blindness that had been placed on them, the leader gave a confident laugh and encouraged the rest of his brethren. Be patient brothers, you'll eventually find them all. The demon's words gave the rest the motivation that they needed, as one by one, each of them took off in different directions, following the trails left behind by their prey. There was a certain confidence that stuck with them. They cannot be vanquished that easily, and no one has ever had the opportunity to do so, and no one will ever be able to send them back to their prison or destroy the source that has been keeping them in power. The remains of the village hall can be seen from behind the beast, and in the midst of the rubbles and debris. There is an open area where a certain scroll was still open and glowing as it continued to radiate the reddish energy that had shone through the sky. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX